Hi everyone, welcome to Stamina Podcast. My name is Christian Puckett. My name is Levi Lobo. And my name is William Courtsworthy Weaver IV. <laughs> uh, today we talked about ethics and photojournalism, Navajo sweat lodges, and not taking no for an answer uh, in terms of pursuing your goals. Thanks for listening. Enjoy the podcast. Thanks for having me. We're going. All right. Okay. We're on. <laughs> So, um, how's it going, Will? Good. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. This is a cool experience. <laughs> nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mr. Will. So, this is William Weaver the Fourth. Yes, William Courtsworthy Weaver the Fourth. How are you guys doing? And we uh, met a little bit ago. Right, right, week right. ago, our friend introduced us, and we just had a great conversation. I thought it'd be great to bring on. Tell us about yourself. Uh, yeah, I'm a photojournalist. That's my main... Uh, passion and dream and uh, i'm a photojournalist for the gallup independent in gallup new mexico uh, i've been there about seven months so yeah it's been a cool experience uh photographing gallup and the wider area of the navajo nation uh that's been fun learning a lot uh getting invited to some cool ceremonies like us uh, you know sweat lodges and things like that Dang. which is supposedly something that doesn't happen but I think, honestly, my whole thing is like, since I'm a black dude, like <laughs> it's easier for me to get in those areas. It really is. Um, so that's that's really interesting. Uh, Wait, how too. so? Well, because usually, like I remember talking to the last couple photographers, they're like, and you know, they're white males and things like that, and they're like, oh, um, you know, like you know, it's kind of hard <laughs> to get photos and things like that. And I'm like, okay. Cool. And then I come in and I haven't had that experience. It's been people are open, you know, I talk to them, they talk to me. Yeah. It's great. It's just everything so far from Gallup though. So it's like to get stories, it's like a yeah. you know, three hour drive. Wait, so Gallup is about two hours west, right? I know I'm, I'm thinking Grants. I'm sorry, I'm thinking Grants. Well, Grants, if you just go, uh, yeah, Gallup is two hours from here. Grants is like an hour from here. Wait, so is Gallup, it's, it's west it's though, right? It's further than Grants. Okay, yeah. so yeah. it's Grants. Then Gallup, Gallup and oh. then Window Rock, Arizona. So okay, you're gotcha. like 30 minutes from the Arizona border from Gallup. 30 minutes away? Yeah, like okay. 30, 35 minutes away, yeah, to Window Rock from Dang, Gallup. Dang, so w what's going on in Gallup? <laughs> like... Skinwalkers. <laughs> like, that's, that's actually something that I did see is um, um, and hear about is you hear about skinwalkers and you Google search them and they come up as like demonic monsters. But then you talk to the like farmers who are on like in Montesisco Mesa um, near Shiprock and uh, or Shiprock adjacent, I should say. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, they're like, oh, they're people, real people with uh with uh, coyote furs on and pelts and that's why you don't see in the Navajo Nation you don't see pelts of like coyotes or foxes or anything like that because that associates you with a skinwalker and to be a skinwalker you have to kill uh, a close relative supposedly really okay, right I've, I've never heard I've, I've heard, heard this this is, this is you've just... heard you've heard skinwalkers like the no, I haven't. like if you google it they're like these like scary creatures yeah. like uh, spiritual creatures but, but you discovered that they're, they're real. real. They're real, um, you know, and, and they're, they are people. You can, I mean, if you take some time and, like, uh, hang around, like, people who are doing cattle and stuff out on the Navajo Nation, they'll talk about, oh, you know, I saw a skinwalker come past, and I'm, like, talking to this guy. His name's Elmer Yazi, and uh, he's like, oh, yeah, you know, maybe there's some skinwalkers and things like that that come on my land and everything. And I'm like, oh, okay, like, so we're talking spiritual. And he's like, no, like, yes, there's a spiritual aspect. And he's like, that's what you know. And that's what people have, you know, who aren't Navajo know. But he's like, they are real people. And, you know, then he talks getting into this thing. Like, he's like, oh, they can make your gun misfire or they can control Bro. dogs. But he's like, and I'm like, okay, so for me, that's spiritual stuff. Mm -hmm. And then so, but we are talking about that. These are real people. And he's like. Yes. Wow. And they usually have, like, they're, like, vagabonds or things, something like that, just transient people who just are evil, and they go around doing evil stuff, supposedly, like, just like a regular thief or criminal. And I'm mm. like, wow, that's something cool. And I really want to do a photo uh, visual essay on it because I'm like, oh, that means I can meet them, you know, be their friend and things like that. And that's how yeah. my mind thinks uh, about Everything really, and like, how can I get photos and how can I tell this story? And he's like, I don't think you want to do that. Um, 
So. And that probably makes you want to do it even more. Because you're <laughs> right, like, no exactly. one else has. No one else has what I could possibly get. So I'm working on it right now. But it, I may fail, and that's okay, because I'm young. And, you know, this is my first time doing this, and I'm learning a ton. So, Do you know, like, any, like, self-defense skills? Self-defense In case, like, skills. a skinwalker starts trying to get freaky with you? <laughs> I have a knife that I made. Okay, good. On my belt, actually, right now. Yes, I some uh, guy taught me, um, and I took photos of him, and he was like, oh, I'll teach you how to make a knife, and I was like, I would really love that, and he works at uh, La Matanita Co-op in Gallup. Okay. So when I was moving out to Gallup, the whole thing was like, oh, where do I get food that's, like, not from Walmart and stuff like that, because mm-hmm. I like organic food and everything like Let's that. Let's go. And uh, so when you said you worked at Whole Foods, I was like, oh, wow, like you probably did. Um, Dude, it's really nice having a 30 percent discount what? on groceries, especially these days. You know, you're going to have to go get my food for me because 30 <laughs> I got to go you know, do some runs for some people. <laughs> but yeah, so La Mata Need to co is like it's like literally like maybe just a little bit bigger than this room um, wow. in Gallup. It's like a small, small, small co-op. Yeah. And I meet this guy. His name's Adrian. I believe his last name is Curly, and uh, he, I asked him, I was like, can you make me a knife? And, like, then when I was out there taking photos of him, and he was literally had a, you know, like a uh, uh, anvil hammer, and he was, you know, putting the metal in and, you know, pounding it. Yeah. You know, and I was like, that's cool. Can you teach me how to do it? And I'm there for, like, what, 15 minutes pounding the thing, and my hands are dead. You know, I can't even get the hammer to... Yeah, you're smithing away. You know, and I'm, it's my first time. I hand, I'm like, oh, man, this feels like I'm climbing again and, like, rock climbing at Stone Age or something like that. And he's Heck just yeah. like... Yeah, and I'm like, you know, <laughs> barely can pick the go. hammer up and everything like that. So he uh, he made me this knife Whoa, right bro. Here. Whoa. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> Dude, I want to see it. Yeah. And it's... Uh, Whoa, that wow, actually looks that is beautiful. Really it's, it's really nice, Damascus... Actually. Yes, sir. Damascus. Damascus steel. Um, is that a thing? It's a yeah. Yeah, it's I a just pad. guessed. Honestly, so it's steel. It's steel. It's a CRV can I hold it? tin. Yes, sir. You can hold it. Whoa, um, man, it's th- so beautiful. I love the way that steel does that when they. You sure you didn't get us out of the, the bespoke <laughs> box? What is no, that? No, no, no. You know those like, oh, month, like, like monthly subscription box, things, yeah. and then they say. Oh, I have, kidding. I have video. So now I'm like, no, you know, it's I'm beautiful. being one for my friend too. So oh I'm my like, gosh, is this the dude's insignia? Yes, yes, yes. Wow. So he helped. Me. I helped. That's what I say. I didn't like make the whole thing, but I I was there and helping, and it was just an amazing experience to see oh something go from like a stick of steel. Yeah. To that man, what a fun process! I'm sure it is, and I like doing things like that. I know when I was in school at UNM, I would like go to Double Eagle Airport and oh, like wow. uh, do uh, what is it, what is it called? Uh, uh, trike flying, which is you're literally like on this thing with three wheels with a hang glider. Oh, I've seen that before. My wife has done that. Yeah. Right, and you know they. That's awesome. Isn't this they beautiful? Go, and I would take uh, uh, aero oh. photos like that, and that was amazing. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for sharing that with us. That is amazing. So. So wh- how long did the process to make that knife take? Uh, it would have taken him two weeks if I wasn't there, <laughs> but it took him like, what, from December all the way up to like maybe three weeks ago. Oh, wow. So because, he just delivered it to you. Well, I was there with him and that's why it took so long because I wanted to learn. Oh, wow. So I couldn't okay, come yeah. out like every day because like I have a job and stuff yeah. like that. So and I'm like busy. So I would come out like once or twice a week on Mondays or Fridays. Mondays are my Sunday and Mondays are my day off. So... You know, I'm still taking pictures on those days. And yeah. my mom is always calling me and my dad is like, oh, don't you have a day off? And I'm like, yeah, but like, I love taking photos. Like, photo journals is my passion. Like, this is my day off, but I'm still doing the same yeah. thing. So, yeah. well, so no, where, where do your parents live? Uh, they live between... They travel a lot, you know, because they just... They just had like three. Th- There's you know, they're the, skinwalkers actually. <laughs> <laughs> they just had the triplets. You know, the three of us leave. Okay, yeah. So William is a triplet. Yeah, so I just learned that. So they just had us leave a couple of years ago to go to college and journeys and stuff. And they, yeah. so they travel. They bought a travel trailer and everything, and they oh, go around cool. the country. And you know, so they're between where they live is between uh, Washington and Vancouver, um, and then sometimes Denmark. Okay. They'll go off to Denmark and do whatever. Wow. Um, so it's just a really, they're like really cool. And like they just turned, my dad just turned 51 and my mom's about to turn 51 and everything. And Dang. so they're like, like I'm seeing them as people, which is weird. 
like friends or something like that. Yeah, I mean, as opposed to like the parents, as opposed to the parents, it's just like now they come to the you know like when I was over there a couple of weeks ago to get my minivan, you know, um, you know they asked me for advice about stuff, and I'm yeah. like, oh, that's cool. Whoa, like you're asking me for advice, and not just asking me because you want me to like feel good, but you like actually need my advice. What and, was like, the advice they were asking for? I don't even remember. It was something just like something small. Yeah. It, it was. It wasn't something. It wasn't something small, but it's not big either. It's just like yeah. in the mid ground, and I was like, "Oh well, this is how I think like this should go." And da 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 da. And they were like, "Okay," and they took my advice. Yeah. Well, and like they're figuring each other out because like you know it's like a new relationship now because they're fifty in their fifties, which is for them midlife. And they're empty nesters now, right? Empty your nesters, other right? Siblings. So we're all the same age. We're all twenty three. So we left you know a while ago when we were like seventeen. Is August? I think it was August. 2017 we all came to UNM. Oh wow. Um, you all went to the same college. Yeah, and Gabby transferred out to UNLV in Las Vegas. Shine Steel in, in Albuquerque and then I finished up and everything and went on my way to travel to, you know, basically wherever so I could be try and be a big shot photojournalist or at least build a portfolio. Can you talk about your your travels that you've experienced because you were talking about being in like Afghanistan? So I know, like, the most recent ones is Israel, Panama, and Egypt. Dang. And I was in Panama for, I was supposed to be there for six months, but I was with an NGO called uh, Floating Doctors, um, and they uh, provide medical care to the indigenous car markers of uh, Panama. So that's, like, the Noberi tribe and things like that. And if you go on my Instagram, you'll see a kid sitting in a window of, like, a wooden hut. Um, and I took a picture of him, and he's no Barry, and no Barry is like a mixture of like the native language and Spanish. Mm-hmm. So when I was out there, you're on. I mean, Panama is just a basically a place of islands. So if you don't have a boat, you can't really get around anywhere. Mm-hmm. And that so we were on this small island island with floating doctors, and you know I was there to take a picture, take pictures and things like that. And I was with at the time my girlfriend. Um, and she was, you know, writing and everything like that. And we were kind of like a team and going about this. And it was really, really awesome. You know, I was young and in love and everything like that. So that just made everything even better. I'm like, I'm mm-hmm. out here taking photos. And I have, like, a pretty girl on my arm who I'm in love with. Dang, dude. And I was just head over here. And everything was great. So that was fun. And then what? After, then they were like, oh, we can't afford to, like, pay you anymore. And I'm like... Okay, peace. <laughs> right. Like they told us like the second month and I'm like, they're like, but you can still save stay for like until the sixth month and I'm like, but you're not gonna pay me. And like yeah. you know, like my photos like are good and you want me to provide the same thing without payment? Oh, like gotcha. nah. You know, that was my first right. like, you're like I have to survive out here. They're right. like just it's a non profit. Just donate and, your time. Right. They're like, just donate your time, but then like we'll feed you and yeah. And I'm like, like a work trade, like a, right. But I'm like, I do too much work for just three meals a day. Sure, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like maybe like twelve meals a day, <laughs> and all of them are like steak and yeah. We need to stock up a little bit. Grass fed steak and organic oh, potatoes. Um, wait, 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 let's talk about that. Um, why do you choose to eat healthy? Well, it's just how I grew up. Like, okay. honestly, like I grew up on uh, like eating organic and. <laughs> like, you know, meeting, like going, like in Winnipeg, there was like, I was homeschooled, so it's like a thing that we eat healthy. And then I remember one of the things I remember is like going down to the bread shop where they made local artisanal bread with like whole grain wheat flour and things mm-hmm. like that. I corn flour, which is like an ancient grain. Right. Yeah, yeah. And so I just love that stuff. Like, so your parents just kind of raised. Yeah, three just, of you just, just raised. They're, they're already eating healthy. Eating. Right. I mean, they had their journey from when they were like our age and they're like, we weren't eating so healthy. And my mom and dad are like, yeah, we used to eat like, you know, especially my dad. He's like, yeah, I would drink like a thing, a seven up or a Sprite or whatever. And like really loved McDonald's. And he's like, then like, you know, it was bad for my body. And he's like, we had you guys. And I'm like, I want to be around for my kids. And they had us at like 27. Well, okay. um, so. Um, and then, you know, my dad, he's getting all these PhDs and stuff like that. And he's in school. Like, till this day, this man is still in school. What, really? Wow. And not because he didn't, like, accomplish anything. I'm sure. But it's yeah. because he is literally a lifelong learner and just wants to learn. 
And he's like, well, once you get, like, your bachelor's degree, your master's, and your PhD, he's like, the next PhD is only, like, a year or two. That's how he looks at everything. <laughs> Jeez. Man, I do not function that way. You know, and I'm just like, dang, like, this is what it means to be a lifelong learner. Yeah. And, like, so it, it was just raised, you know, like I said before the podcast, you know, Levi was like, don't talk. <laughs> <laughs> well, you guys are talking about That's such a struggle. interesting <laughs> stuff. And, and uh, you know, we were talking, and I'm just like, yeah, like, they were really about education, and they – knew they could do better than the public school system. Even in Canada, it's like better than America, but it's still not good enough. Mm. And I think that's a really strong statement. I'm going to get some backlash on it, but <laughs> that's okay. Um, Wait, the statement that uh, homeschooling could be better than public school? I think it's, I mean, if you think of like, you go to public school and you're there for what, with 20 to 30 kids with one teacher? Yeah. Where it's, it's three people with two people. I was just talking to uh, somebody about homeschool yesterday, mm-hmm. and uh, yeah, I mean, it, oh, he was saying that he was homeschooled all growing up, and then he went into test into into high school because he was like, I think he, like maybe like tenth grade or something he went to high school, right? And he goes to test in, and he's like, oh no, I'm not going to do good. I'm not going to do good. I've never, I, I, blah, blah, I, I got done with my school in like three hours every morning. I was done at like twelve, and these kids are here till three or four. I'm, there's no way I'm going to be able to compete with these kids. And then he goes in, and he's just like aces it. That's what happened. I know. Like, I think the first like something that wasn't homeschooled was I think it was SAT for sure, and. That was when we were like in Las Cruces and it was so stressful. We're studying and my mom would have us be- wake up at like five thirty, six o'clock. And then we would start school at like six thirty, seven, And mm-hmm. then we would go all the way until like four o'clock. And my dad would come home like when he was working. Because then like if we wanted, since we were homeschool, if we were studying Egypt, we would travel to Egypt. Or if we were studying China, we would travel to China. And my dad would take a year or six months off or whatever from work. And we he would just be there with us to like educate us and just be there as like a whole family unit, which now I see that as super rare because that sounds incredible. Right. You know, and like, I'm like, Oh, if I have kids, I'm going to have to, I learned about China from like photos in a book. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Right. So it's, it's (laughs) it's totally different experience. And I like, don't know geography at all. Most Americans don't do it at all. I was like, (laughs) I was like, Russia's that close. (laughs) What? From Alaska. Yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. it's like just the stone's throw. It really is. By a really strong person, but, you know. <laughs> but, I mean, uh, literally, it, it was like, that stuff was amazing. And just uh, growing up like that, I'm, I'm really appreciative now because I'm, I'm seeing, like, even, like, my friends now in Albuquerque, I'm like, oh, like, you know, I want to move up to Oregon. And they're like, where's that? Like, near New York? And I'm like. Oh, my goodness. Right. <laughs> I'm like, right up, right, right. I'm like, honey, get, 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 just open up Google Maps. Pacific Northwest, come on. Right, the P&W. They're like. Oh, okay, I don't know that. And I'm just like, oh, dang, like, I'm realizing, and I realized before of how, like, privileged I was, and then being African-American is just like, oh, okay, the privilege is even more because of the experiences I had, um, especially coming back to America. It's weird. Um, and What do you mean privilege is even more? Well, I think usually when people look at African-Americans in America especially, you see that, oh, okay, like, like, the privilege, they don't have the privilege of a regular American who is usually most of the time white. Mm -hmm. And like, you know, then me growing up the way I did, I'm like, oh, like, dang, like people see, you know, people, when they look at me, they don't see that. They see like a black dude. And they're like, oh, okay. Like when I was interviewing for a job or something like that, that always comes up. Really? Yeah. Like They ask you, why are you black? Or like, what are they? <laughs> they? They ask me, they're like, oh, so like, what do you want to cover? Like black issues. And that's something that comes up a lot. And I'm just like, oh, I want to cover like international issues. Like the stuff I see like Marcus Yam cover, who is mm-hmm. a photojournalist with the LA Times or something like that. Those are things that I really want to cover and, 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 and be a part of because I want to document history. Mm-hmm. Not saying that stuff in America isn't history, but I, I really just love the international community. And that's yeah. where my heart is. That's where even in Gallup, like... I think it's an international issue what happens in Gallup. Some of the things that happen in Gallup are worthy of national news mm. coverage. So mm. that's something that's interesting to me. That is fascinating. I feel like that's such a sensitive issue now in the U.S. too, talking right. about like race and equality. Right. Um, 
Like I grew up in the international district in Albuquerque, which is one of the worst areas in Albuquerque. Mm -hmm. Um, And I, I, I don't know, like in terms of (laughs) me growing up was not in a, in a good environment. Like my dad was beaten up by gang members or, you know, like we're broken into or like things are just like very different from growing up in a different area. Mm -hmm. And I feel like, um, maybe this is like a bold statement. Maybe it's not, I don't care. I don't know. But, um, like the majority of America statistically is white. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So there will be a majority of white people in every demographic of, uh, wealth distribution um (laughs) i don't know it's like it's hard because like most of this neighborhood is hispanic and it's uh there's some african-american communities there's a little bit of a asian community and then there's a white community uh but i just have i grew up never really identifying or seeing like like race as a as a as a separation of of wealth like And maybe that's just growing up in a homeschooled or growing up not in public school. I played football at my at high school and, uh, but I, I, I don't know. So like, like this whole like thing that's happened, this thing that's emerged in the U S has been very interesting for me to try to understand, have compassion, uh, have, uh, not be offended, but, but also be like, man, there are people that are hurting. Right. And I think like for me, it's really interesting, like, as a photojournalist to want to visually capture that. I know, like, before I was in Gallup, I was in Galesburg, Illinois, which is, like, a small town three hours away from Chicago. Um, and they had a Black Black Lives Matter protest, and I was there photographing it, and you see that, like, I'm literally the, like, out of the photographers, I'm the only black photographer. Um, so I can get access to things that some people can't. Um, and like it benefits me, but then I'm like, oh, why does it benefit me? And like, do I have like the know-how since at the time I was like 22, you know, 21, 22, whatever. Like, do I have the know-how to like do this ethically Mm -hmm. to tell this story that like, yes, I am black, but do I understand their struggle? Mm -hmm. Do I actually, with the way I grew up, do I actually understand the the struggle that is you know the black struggle or you know like who do i relate to and that's been something that like i continuously even now ask myself because like when i'm in gallup the first week i was in there supposedly people don't get invited to sweat lodges yeah you know on the navajo nation i'm talking about like in shiprock on the navajo nation yeah um what a what a privilege what a blessing what and it is but then people are just like oh yeah come to you want to come to sweat lodge and i'm like i don't even know what that is i'm like (laughs) i mean like what is a sweat lodge oh it's basically a sauna okay cool (laughs) i go out there on a sunday at like 9 a.m and in the near ship rock and i'm like whoa wait can you explain it and so I'm driving out there, and Shiprock is a small town. Like I think it's like an hour and fifty eight minutes away from Gallup. Because I'm a Google Maps guy, I, I can't get fifty eight minutes to yeah. the third, one hour, hour fifty eight minutes to the T. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, that's how I am. I'm like, oh, like how far is this? Like, what time do I need to wake up? Even coming here today, I was like, okay, like I can wake up, I can leave right at seven o'clock to get here. Dude, I think you were here at nine o'clock and Levi and I were kind of... Well, I was, you, here at, I was here at 8.57. Oh, um, wow. Dude, okay. <laughs> you were on time, bro. That was the other thing. When we, when we met the other day, right. you were on time, right? Right. It's just, I, it's just... Were you? Yeah. Okay, good. Yeah, yeah. I was early. Yeah, you were early. I was and early I was, I was, cooking I came my burrito. There, and that, that, I, like, I, I mean, I knew it was you because I was like, okay. There's a like, weirdo over here. Levi Lobo, like, what is this guy going to look like? <laughs> so I see somebody like squatting looking intensely at I didn't know what it was but it's something in a microwave and I can stand up behind him I'm like it's a burrito and I tap him I'm like are you Levi he's like yeah bro wait where was this at this was at Michael Thomas Coffee Michael Thomas on okay. Bryn Mawr so I was just like staring deeply into this microwave right I literally stood there for like 30 seconds out the door and I'm like looking around and I'm like no one Lobo Levi Lobo and I'm like that dude <laughs> the homeless guy that's cooking his burrito and you know he has a Jesus beard and everything getting and his eyes like, fried by the microwave <laughs> I'm just like okay that's him you know so um, but yeah it's it's explaining the, the sweat lodge it, it was very uh, you know driving out there I think they have one McDonald's 
And so I'm I'm going to the McDonald's and like I'm and the guy's texting me and he's like, you know, Google Maps isn't gonna work out here really once you like pass the McDonald's and I'm like what. Mm. You know, so I and he's like, take a left right after the McDonald's at the stoplight, and that's how people communicate. Really, a stones throw from the tree with the twelve. They really do. Leaves. I've been on the Navajo yeah. Nation driving around, and they'll literally tell me like, like in Ganado, Arizona, or um, what's another place, Tohatchi. Um, they'll tell me, oh well, like you go down a road that's like five miles this w- west, and that's why I'm like, okay, I'm not a compass. My brain doesn't work <laughs> like that. Yeah. You know, like, so that's why I plan everything. I plan everything out, like, through Google Maps or, you know, f- figuring it out. So when I get there, I'm like, because the first time I moved to Gallup, I was like, oh, how did I get there? And the guy's like, you know, over the phone, he's like, well, I don't get service out here. And he's like, you'll come up to this dirt road. And he's like, usually around 3.30, there's a dog. Whoa. Oh, my gosh. That wow. comes to this dirt road and take a left on that dirt road. And I'm like. So what happens if the dog isn't there? <laughs> and he's like, the portal closes he's, and you right. can't get there. He's like, then you won't know which dirt road it is, but the dog should be there. So my luck is that I go out to, you know, I think it was Tohatchi, but I'm not sure. Um, I go out and I'm just like, okay, you know, driving around in, in, in my Buick on a dirt road that my Buick probably can't handle, but I'm out there and I'm happy about it because I'm like, oh dang, like. I'm getting paid to take photos. I'm getting paid to take tell stories. Not much. I'm not getting paid much, but I'm getting paid. (laughs) Right. Building your portfolio. Building my portfolio and everything like that. And so I go up there and I'm the one in a million person, right? If it's gonna happen to somebody, it's gonna happen to me. (laughs) And you know, even my mom says that and she's You're a triplet. Right. She one in a million, you'll be a triplet. And so, you know, that's kind of my thing. It's like one in a million, good or bad, it'll happen to me. So I'm like the dog's not going to be there. <laughs> and he's like, no, maybe it'll be there. And I'm like, okay. You know, he's an old veteran. Um, and there's actually issues around that on the Navajo Nation. But anyway, you know, I go and I'm looking at all these dirt roads, you know, driving, thumping in my Buick, you know, over big potholes and like washed out roads. And then there's the point where I can't even see a road. It's just like dirt and, you know, hard compacted dirt and there's no dog. So then I have to drive back to Gallup. <laughs> Oh, no. Because I don't have service out in Tohatchi. Um, so an hour and 58 minutes back to Gallup? Uh, Tohatchi is like, I, I think it's two hours from Gallup, I think. Okay. So I'm just like. <laughs> Not 158. <laughs> back then, with the wind. Right. Direction, oh, right. Yeah. Okay, I was slows you down a little bit. Right. By, by the crow flies <laughs> yeah. and everything like that. Um, and so I call this guy and he's just like, oh, okay. Like, yeah, you know, like, come back out. The dog should be there now. And then, then the dog was there. So, but then going back to Shiprock is that's how people give directions. So they're like, take a left at the McDonald's and go, you know, two miles west or whatever. Mm-hmm. And I'm just like, doesn't compute. So I try and listen. And, like, I'm just, like, driving around. And it looks, you know, like, the Navajo Nation is, like, really, what's the word for this? It's rough looking. And yeah. I'm not saying that to be disrespectful or anything, but it just doesn't it doesn't look like Albuquerque. Right. You know, yeah. it, 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 In terms of like developed it, uh, yeah, it's places, like, it's less developed, has less resources and money right, than Albuquerque. Of course. Or basically. Because Albuquerque is supported by the government. government. Of course. <laughs> yeah. And um, so, you know, I'm going out there and I'm looking around and I'm like, oh, where is this? So then like, I think I know where it is. And I just like, this is going to sound weird. I'm like, oh, I'm just going to follow my heart. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so I turn into some place that I think it is and it was there. And it's 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 like, you know, just just something dug out in. um, The you know, the, they have like this tarp stuff over it. And if have you guys watched Yellowstone? Mm, no. OK, well, there's an episode where they have a sweat lodge and I was like, it looks exactly like that. And so they're like, oh, yeah, like, you know, take off your shirt and like you don't you don't want long pants. You want uh, shorts and everything like that. So I have some shorts on. I put them on and, you know, like it's just bare bones. And I see a fire going on with these big rocks, you know, rocks like the size of my head. You know, and I feel like I have a pretty big head. <laughs> um, so, you know, they heat them up and then you sit in this uh, this enclosed contraption. It's like a circle. And it's dug out in the dirt, and you sit down, and they start putting the rocks in it with a Y-shaped 
um, uh, you know, uh, uh, branch to move and uh, the rocks out of the fire and put them in the middle and they pour sage water on them. Mm. And it actually feels really good. And then they're like, oh yeah, like it gets really hot in here. Uh, like you can't leave a- until after each session. And there are f- usually four se- sessions. There was a fifth one called the warrior round. Whoa. Whoa. Okay. And they're like, so we may do a warrior round today, William. How do you feel about that? I'm like, <laughs> you know, I'm like, I'm great. I'm gonna do it. Yeah, you Dang, gotta, you gotta come do the on. warrior round. I'm a warrior. You come are. A warrior. <laughs> I've been here a week, but I'm a warrior. <laughs> um, so you know, they're they're you know a bunch of older Navajo guys and things like that, and they're laughing, and joking around with me. And then we sit down, and they, you know, take the bucket of sage water, and they're like, Psh, smoke comes out billows, and then they start chanting, and you know they like to joke a lot, you know, really corny jokes like. You know, hey, if you want to ask a question, just put your hand up. And I'm like, okay, why would he be saying that? <laughs> and then they, you know, there's like a, a door right there. And it's just like a like a piece of um, a wolf skin or something like that. It's some type of pelt or something it looks like. And he takes it down and, whoosh, and it's dark. You can't even see the hand Whoa. in front of your face. Uh. Um and he's like, yeah, Will, if you have a question, put your hand in. <laughs> and I'm like, it's just pitch black. In there. <laughs> and I'm like, dang it, you're, 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 you're like a salamander in, in a can of salamanders, I guess. Or uh, what are those things called? Uh, sardines. Sardines. Excuse me. Like, it's, that's how packed, that's how packed it is. You're shoulder to shoulder with somebody you don't know. Basically in your underwear. Some guys are in underwear. Some guy has a hole in his underwear. You can see everything. You're super close. Yeah. Um, how many some, people are in there? Uh, I want to say like ten to fifteen. And how, how big is this? The it's space? not big at all. It's like you're you're cramped. You're literally like, okay, yeah. you know, you're a sardine. <clears throat> you're a sardine. Yeah. Um, is this the warrior round yet, or are you still no, no, warming up to be- it? No, no, this is beginning, beginning, oh like first round, right? And then so they start chanting, and I'm like, I don't, because they're speaking Navajo, and I don't know anything mm. other than like, ya ate, which is like I think hello. It's, yeah, it's hot, yeah. Um. So I'm just like, yeah, pitch black. Like, I'm trying to sing along. And then after the first round, like, it's hot. And it gets just gets hotter through each round. So then around the fourth round, I'm, like, thinking, like, I need to get out. <laughs> and I'm just like, oh, and the third round I got out. I did because I couldn't take it anymore. But the first round, I'm like, oh, I'm going to do it. Like, I want to get up to that fifth round. So then I'm just, like, in there. And I start beating my chest. Ah, uh, not even singing. Dang. It's dark, and they're like, "Yeah," and they're you know singing in their language, things like that. I'm just into it. I'm like, I'm gonna get through this. Yeah. Thumping out a beat, and then like they're singing, and we're it's like a brotherhood at that moment because you connect through that mm. discomfort, which is really weird to say for me. Like you're connecting to this discomfort. You don't even know the guy's name sitting next to you, and if you do, great. But like I didn't. Um, and then so we get to the warrior round, and the warrior round just gets abnormally hotter where when you breathe in it literally burns your throat oh my gosh with so much steam and heat you're like (gasps) and it burns and you're like dang like i felt like i was gonna die and uh they're like oh you can turn around and face the wall if it gets too hot and just get close to the ground and i'm like i'm not doing that i'm gonna make myself as tall as possible because because you're a warrior i'm a warrior (laughs) a sardine warrior (laughs) yes (laughs) So then, uh, you know, after it lasts about like five minutes because each round gets shorter and shorter because it gets hotter and hotter and they don't want you to die. Yeah. So then, you know, like you, you know, like then you crawl out and I'm crawling, sweating, sweating. Like I feel like I look like melted chocolate. That's how I feel like. And I'm just like, then you have to shake everybody's hand to get in another line and everything like that. And they're like, good job. You want to come back next Sunday? And like I'm dehydrated. I feel like I'm going to pass out. You know, these guys are strong. And they're like, oh, this is for your health. And, you know, we had um, smoked some mountain tobacco that they collected Dang. from some mountain near Shiprock. Wow. Um, which is amazing. And then sage water, and you they would pass it around, and you would drink it. And, like, I'm like, oh, dang, like, I'm a statistics guy. Like, that's what I like <laughs> to look at. So I'm like, dang, like, the Navajo Nation, like, has a lot of, like, supposedly – STDs or whatever like that. So then everybody's just drinking from literally the bucket. Uh oh. 
So I'm doing it too. <laughs> and then afterwards, I'm like, dang, that was kind of that was kind of fun, but maybe kind of stupid. Yeah, like maybe I shouldn't have done. Maybe that. I shouldn't have done that. But like, it was amazing. You're and, fine. And I go back, like every like at least once a month, I tried to go. Yeah. Um, you know, just because like money and you know, it's it's about you know two hour drive from my house and yep. things like that. So that's amazing. And I like get invited to that stuff. And like now, I'm trying to like meet with the chapter leaders. Um, you know, all around Ganado, Arizona, Tohatchi. They have chapter houses all over the Navajo Nation. I'm trying to go out of all of them. And so people know me and that I'm a photojournalist and I want to tell their story. And I shouldn't say tell because I'm not the person at the forefront. I want to capture their story and have them tell it. Mm, okay. And I just want to be the visual, the visual representation of like somebody who cares enough to like talk to them because supposedly that doesn't happen a lot. Like photographers just come in and start taking photos. I want to talk to them, get their permission. Can I be on yeah. your land? Is that okay? Um, things like that. And then so what I'm finding out, like from Elmer Yazi, he's you know teaching how to ride horses and uh, how to take care of cattle. And basically, and this is the gentleman that introduced you to the sweat lodges. Uh, no. Oh, no. okay. This is another gentleman who like knows the people that I go to the sweat lodge with, but he's just like, oh, that's cool. And like that's how he figured out. He's like, oh, so you're a good guy, because he's like. You know, you got invited to a sweat lodge by these guys at Shiprock. That doesn't happen. And so you yeah. you have to be invited. You have to be invited. You okay. can't just go. Right. They'd be um, like, who the hell are you, dude? Right, right. Right. Because right. yeah, totally. this is this is a sacred ceremony. And the thing is, like, I I always want to take photos. And they're like, no. You can't take photos. on you the can't. Re- you, can't, you can't take photos on reservations, right? Mm, you can go. Or you have to have, like, special permission. You, I mean, there's really no spe- – it's kind of like the Wild West. Like, yeah. Elmer Yazi, his cow, he has, like – 50 cows his cows will get stolen mm. <laughs> people will come on his land and steal his cows like literally like old west style and he's like well you can either shoot them or call the cops and he's like the tribal police doesn't respond that fast he's like i'm out in the middle of uh, uh the mesa montesco mesa so he's like shoot him and shoot him. he goes <laughs> so like literally i've Dang. seen people come up and steal cows and like i'm learning how to ride a horse and everything like that and like uh um what's the word um uh, saddle or uh, um, rodeo wrang- cows. wrangle wrangle, wrangle yeah, you know um, and everything like that cows so it's just like dang like I'm like this is the wild west so there is no permission yeah. when you go on the Navajo Nation really it's, like, all, it's all like nonverbal I feel like it's like you a, can go but if somebody gets mad at you like you're out there by yourself right I just like dr- driving past like the Jemez Pueblo, I know there's signs like uh, right by the road that are just like no photographs, like no phones, like don't. That's take- Jemez. That's 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 more, I would say, developed. Okay. The you know if you go out to Shiprock, I don't have you guys been to Shiprock? Yeah. I've driven by. It. I've never been. So if you've driven the- by, it, there's no signs or really anything. Yeah. Like it's literally you can just go, and basically do whatever you want, and. So, you know, I like to do it the what I feel like is the right way, the ethical way. Um, so I try and ask permission from chapter house leaders or things like that because they don't have chiefs anymore, um, at least from my knowledge, um, which as you talk to people, they're like, it's very decentralized, whereas a chief would centralize everything and then the chief leaders would meet up and, um, you know, back in, you know, 1800s and things like that would meet up and, and talk about the issues surrounding their people. Now they don't really have that. They just have a president. Um, and when you talk to people, there are varying uh, opinions about Jonathan Nez, um, you know, that he's not for the people. Wait, um, who's that? He's the president of the Navajo Nation. Oh, okay. So if you go up to Winter Rock, Arizona, um, the pres- that's where the president of the Navajo Nation is. There's the Navajo Nation Council Chambers. Um, so it's voted now. It's like a democratic yeah, they vote. Uh, they're doing voting a, system. They're doing a vote. Um, I think people just announced their president. They're running for the president. I think uh, like two weeks ago, a week oh, ago. Wow. Um, so that's exciting. From at least like a journalistic per- 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 perspective, it's really exciting because I'm like, oh, I can cover that visually. Like, what does this mean? What are the people thinking? And that's a lot of work to. Mm. figure out what the people are thinking because mm. I don't just want to do it by votes because how can I visually represent votes? Mm. 
you know, like I can go to the voting booth, but then there's things like, oh, you can't take a picture of somebody voting and da 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 da. So, um, photo journals, photo, photo wise, it's, it's, it's very interesting to me. Um, how am I going to cover that visually? Um, mm-hmm. and there, there's a lot of issues on the Navajo nation and just around that, like the MMIW and our, uh, issues. That's the missing, murdered indigenous women and relatives where wow. a lot of indigenous women and people will just go missing Crazy. And, and no one cares. It seems like dang, the police are like, oh, give it 48 hours. You know, if somebody reports it, they're like, give it 48 hours. And that's standard for any um, police. Uh, Even like not not on the res. Even not, not, not on like the res. Even here in police Albuquerque, they're like, give it 48 hours. Now I'm thinking, okay, now on the reservation, you know, this is happening. You know, this is an issue. 48 hours, I can be in. I literally can drive up to Vancouver in 48 hours yeah, or less. That's a yeah. long time. It's 20, I think it's like 27 hours to Washington, to Seattle from here. So then 48, I'm in Canada. Yeah. You can be in Mexico in six hours. Dang. So I'm just like, okay, just think of like sex trafficking, things like that. Uh, 48 hours is a lifetime. Right. Yeah. And so it's just kind of such a common. It is common. You literally get like, I, I had to turn off my Amber alerts. Because you can Dang. get you get so many, yeah. but then the thing is, you get so many, but the ones you don't get mm. are astronomical. Um, you have a lot of like women being raped and things like that on the Navajo Nation, um, and it surrounds like you have this ancestral abuse that's happened to the indigenous people. So then now they don't really have a way to heal. Um, when you talk to them, um, they're like, well, and even just when you go there, like Elmer Yazi does not own his land. He is allowed to live on that land, but the government owns it, but he's only allowed to do certain things with the land. So you have like, Hmm. they call it a food desert. Um, and that's super interesting to me because I'm like, oh, what does that mean? Like. You know, they eat fry bread, which is if you do the history of fry bread, fry bread is what um, is the, you know, I'm just going to say Americans gave them when they were like killing off their buffalo and things like that and captured the indigenous people. They gave them oil and flour. So what can you make? You can make fry bread out of oil and flour. So Mm -hmm. that's part of their culture, but it's not part of their historical diet. Oh, yeah. so it's something that's been introduced so it's something in the last been, eight, uh, 200 years. Per right. Second. So then that's why you have a lot of obesity and things like that on the Navajo Nation is because of those things and trying to solve it or trying because my goal as a photojournalist is to make a positive impact on the community, mm-hmm. any community I'm in, whether I'm in Israel, Panama, Egypt, whatever. What can I do and how do I understand how to make an impact is by talking to people. So I spend a lot of time sitting and talking with people. Mm. And usually not getting a lot of photos because most people are like, "Eh, I don't want photos. I'm trying to go after the, you know, talk to these women who have been sex trafficked and who have experienced uh, family members being kidnapped or what have you, raped, murdered. You have a lot of murders on the Navajo Nation that literally just go unsolved. Yeah. Yeah. Somebody's aunt uh, literally was just disappeared. And they're like, oh, you know, in Red Mesa, Arizona. And they're like, oh, well, like, I'm trying to get help for my aunt because, like, no one can do anything. Like, she just went missing. And they're like, oh, that's not like her. She just doesn't go walking out on the res by herself. And I'm like, oh, where do you think she went? And she's like, I don't know. She's like, this is weird because my aunt's gone and no one seems to care. Do you feel like it's statistically a higher percentage than that in which happens in the States? Or is it just that... Right now, it's it's being because because I mean, in this neighborhood, there was probably plenty of <laughs> in Albuquerque as a demographic. So I guess that's my question: was like taking the the population density and number, and then breaking it down. Like, oh, are these statistics actually outrageous in terms of like the police department not being able to manage it or not having the resources? Mm-hmm. Um, I would say to answer your question, like, usually with communities of color, you have a lot of 
things that happen that go unreported. Um, whether that's rape, kidnappings, or anything. Because, you know, um, there was a female last year who went missing, and it was a national issue. Um, she was white. I forgot her name. Oh, yeah, the whole thing. She right. went off with the dude, and then the dude ended up killing her, and then right. getting found. He killed himself in a de- right. yeah, desert. That, that remember a nat- the story? That came? I don't. That was a she national She was like a social issue. media. She wanted to become a social media star, and so her and her boyfriend were traveling in a bus around. Right. And then... They appeared in a few places, posted a few photos, and then she just disappeared. Right. Then he fled to his parents, and then he fled away, and then the FBI and everyone was searching for him. He ended up writing a note and killing himself in Florida or something. Right. And that was a national issue. But that was national news. Yeah. But you had these, you had... It's like happened time and time again, (laughs) and no press, no no media coverage. And even when you do, it seems like no one cares. Yeah. Um... So I don't know the, 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 the statistics to answer your question, but I do know that like I've been there long enough where I'm like sitting there and I'm paying attention to what's happening, or as much as I can, because I can't capture everything. Yeah. And I can't be there for everything. But you know, when ten girls go missing who are like seventeen and the same age as the other girl, like yes, the other girl, I understand that if it was me, I would want to be a national press issue too because I'm me. Yeah. And I want to be found, and every family should have that press though. Yeah, that's what I feel right. like out of my yeah. heart. But realistically, it happens too much. So I guess I have a question and, and I have an example to kind of describe what I'm trying to right. understand. Um, I have a, a friend who recently has uh, gained more stability in their life. They were living on the streets and now they're not. Okay. And we've been in the process of kind of working with them, trying to trying to understand what was going on because mm-hmm. they're a really good person. Right. And they have a lot of heart and they're not on drugs and they're, and they work their ass off. <clears throat> but anyways, asking this person a little bit about his story, I found out that he was staying at a person's house that was physically abusing him and assaulting him mm-hmm. and stole his uh, identification. Mm-hmm. And so I'm looking at that going, why didn't you report that? Why didn't you, why didn't you call the police the second this guy pulled a gun and hit you with the back of it? Why didn't you call the police on that? Why didn't you report that he stole all of your stuff? Why, why is that? I, I don't know if that's a reoccurring element is that maybe people feel defeated or they, or it's wrapped up in something bigger so they don't report it or they do report it and it's not heard. But I think it's a combination of that as well as like, at least in that example, in this neighborhood, he didn't report it. Mm-hmm. And that for me is like weird, weird. Right. It's, it's, it happens on, it happens everywhere. I think sometimes it's, and I, I can't relate because I've never had that happen to me, but I have had friends who've gone through that and they're like, oh, well, like I would feel like unheard. Like, um, you know, I've had f- female friends who've been raped and I'm like, why don't you report it? And they're like, oh, well, if I report it, then it's just going to be an invasive thing. And then like, then if I take it to court, they're going to ask me all these questions and it's going to be my fault that I got raped. And I'm like, how could it be your fault that mm. you got raped? And they're like, if I report it, that's how it would seem like, oh, she was wearing, and they're like, oh, I was at a club, I was drunk, da 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 yeah. And I'm like, it's still not your fault, though. Like, right. just because some asshole decides to rape you, like, it, that just because you were drunk doesn't make it your fault. Yeah. And they're like, but that's not how people think. So, I, I don't. So, I would encourage people to report it and don't accept that it's okay. Don't right. accept stuff like that as in any way okay. Like, <laughs> And I mean, that's, I don't know. It's hard. Because it just I, breaks my heart. I remember, and, and the, the things that I've learned by traveling is a lot of the same stuff happens all over the world. Yeah. I was in Israel and for three months um, in 2019 through 2020. Um, and the stuff that happens there is crazy. Um, you know, I was there to, to, to try and make it as a photo journalist and to try and get a job with Associated Press or or the European Press Photo Agency or something like that. I, I was there, you know, living in a hostel because I was like, I don't have much money. Um, or I was really, I don't want to spend a lot of money yeah. uh, because I have to, to to spend money on my gear. And as we know, Sony cameras are expensive. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I was there for three months. And, and, and you see these protests and fights that happen. And, you know, I was in the Negev Desert, which is close to... Um, Egypt and you just hear constant like boom 
big booms because of some war that's going on for no reason. Yeah. And they're like, oh, I'm like, is that Egypt? And they're like, no, that's Gaza. And I'm like, what? Constantly? And then you look up in the sky and you see trails of like white clouds. And I'm like, well, those are weird clouds. And like, those are missiles. Wow. And I'm like, what do you mean? And they're like, oh, our Iron Dome defense system usually stops these all these missiles from Gaza. And I'm like, but those are a lot. And they're like, yeah, like hundreds of missiles a day. That's absolutely You're crazy. in Jerusalem. You're in Jerusalem, which is like metropolitan, you know, people are in like Gucci um things just hanging out, you know, eating eating Gal pizza, dolls, like you know, you yeah. Know, eating with. eating pizza, you know, yeah. uh kosher of course. But <laughs> right, yeah. uh, you know, things like that. Um and 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 you see trails in the sky and you're like and it's become normal. Um you know, these protests between the Palestinians. That's a that's a, a very interesting comparison. The normalization of, of stuff like that. Right. From on a small scale, from right. the person not reporting the person hitting him in the back of the head with a gun to a large scale, like, oh, those are bombs that are or those are missiles that are getting taken down by the Iron Dome. Right. You know, it's it's it's, like, it's, it's, it's this and and talking to the people who are there, they're like, Oh, this is just how it is. Like, I got to go to the um Al Mosque, the mosque uh, in Jerusalem with the golden um, uh, top on it, mm-hmm. who, who, and it's famous for that. Something always happens there on, you know, uh, Palestinian, like Ramadan. I was like, oh, something's going to happen there. And I have friends who I text over Facebook and things like that, and they're like, yeah, we're going to go pray and something's going to happen. LOL. And I'm like, that's not funny. So then Jeez. you look on the news these last couple of days, and then the IDF, which is the Israeli Defense Force, um, a fight breaks out. Don't know the reason why, but it's like people are getting smacked in the back of the head with guns. And, you know, you're walking around as an American or for me as a Canadian American, whatever, a Jew, um, you know, like, oh, like you kind of like for me, I was like, oh, these are my people. You know, da, da, da. And then I'm walking around like as a photo drone, So I'm like, oh, this is bad because you're walking around in the Christian area and there's no guards at all. But you go to the Muslim area. Oh, the Muslim quarter, and you see the IDF with huge guns. AKs. No, I mean they're not even AKs. There's like stuff that's better than an AK supposedly. Wow. <laughs> and I'm like, that's like an assault rifle. Like literally, Jeez. like if you hold it and just hold it down, it'll take out a whole crowd. Dang. And they have, um, you know, bulletproof vests. For these are like war ones. These aren't just like oh, these protect against a handgun. These are made for like. They're rated to be on the other side of that gun. They're rated 4A, which is there's a rating for uh, body armor, and it goes from 1 to, like, 4A. And these are armor for armor-piercing bullets. And I'm like, why do you guys need that? And they're just like, oh, you know, like, the Muslims can, can get kind of rowdy. And I'm like, oh gosh. seriously? Dang. That That's the, what they say. They're like, oh, uh, the Muslims can get kind of rowdy, like, da 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 and I'm uh-huh. like, oh, because I told the guy I was Jewish before. So he's like, oh, yeah, the Muslims can get kind of ratty. And I'm like, what does that mean? What do you mean by that? And so, you know, I'm rad and I see a protest happen and the idea of soldier hits like some guy who's like close to my age. At the time, I'm like 20, 21. And I'm like, dang, like, you know, like just with the back of his gun. And then a whole protest breaks out and a whole fight breaks out. You have tear gas flying in and that was my first time being in like tear gas and mm-hmm. I'm just like oh dang taking photo and I'm still taking photos You're taking pictures um you know cause I'm like I have a responsibility you know to cover this even though it's not gonna get published cause I don't have those connections at the moment but like I still have a responsibility to like make myself better as a photojournalist mm. so I can cover more things like this and for me it was an amazing experience because I'm like, oh, I get the privilege to, 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 to be in this and to talk to these people. And, you know, I'm going to Ramallah talking to Palestinians about what's happening. Um, and while I'm in Ramallah, um, I think it was like December 2019, a, a school with a bunch of kids gets tear gas for no reason. Jeez. Literally, you just see like, pew, breaks a window, tear gas. Kids are coming out crying. And I'm just like. You know, like, why? I can't find a reason. Yeah. But, you know, I'm like, oh, dang, like that. It, it was it was literally horrible. And uh, that's what I've learned traveling is is everywhere is different, vastly different, but also everywhere is also 
vastly the same too. Mm, on like mm. yeah, like a micro right. or a macro lens. Because do you think you're gonna like stay here in New Mexico or like try to stay in Gallup or do you see yourself sort of expanding or just constantly traveling? I, I I'm young and this is again this is like my first dad job so I don't like. I think the big thing was like, oh, I'm a professional now. And like for me, that was like a really endearing moment because I was a kid who grew up off of Nat Geo. Um, so to have a job as a photojournalist, yeah. especially now this time where like staff jobs are so hard to get. Sure. You're like, feel blessed. But then you're like, oh, there's so much more that I can do. You know, like Gallup is like my training stage, I guess. If yeah. we're talking about like a, like, you know, if this was like an anime TV show or something, like <laughs> this is my training arc. Um, totally. So I, I definitely want to expand and I'm always looking for ways to expand and I definitely want to travel more and tell these stories. I think for me right now, it's like learning how to, cause you know, like right. I'm not an expert at anything I'm doing. I'm literally just learning as I go. And like now I do, since I've been around a little bit and I've seen a lot of different things and been a part and talked to so many people, I've been like, okay, I know how to do this. I know how to ask questions. I know how to shoot a story, but how do I have that impact? How do I make a positive change? You know, the dream is, and every photojournalist wants to cover a war. That's that's the thing. Mm. You're young, you want to cover a war. Because you want to be in Ukraine right now. <laughs> that's funny that you say that. Um, and um, Why is it funny? <laughs> I want to go to Because you want to go to Ukraine. I, I do want to go to the Ukraine, but then at the same time, I'm also like, okay, well, there's other places that are just as important but aren't being covered, like Tigray. Mm. For example, this is like no coverage in the news media right now. Wait, where is that? Tigray is in Ethiopia. Um, yeah, see, I wouldn't have known. So. How do you know that? I read a lot. Like, you know, my mom's like, I can't take the news because like it's bad. I love that stuff because I'm like, oh, this is like learning for me. Like I'm I'm a voracious reader. Um, you know, anything from Don Quixote to, to the Count of Monte Cristo, like whatever. I'll pick it up and read it. Dude, that um, movie is my favorite movie. <laughs> See, I'm talking about the book. I know, I'm a movie guy. <laughs> I'm a movie guy too, but I love books. I love information. I love reading the news. Um, and I feel like that just prepares me to expand mm. as a photojournalist, to be like, oh, okay, I know what's happening through a Western perspective. <clears throat> now I should go and get what's happening on the ground. You know, I've talked to a lot of photojournalists who have gone to T. Gray, and they're like, oh, yeah, like, um, you know, what'll happen is the militia where will come into, let's say, a, a, um, a village and to desensitize this village, they'll have, they'll go into a hut. Let's say there's a family of five there, you know, um, mom, dad, three kids. They'll be like, put the family at gunpoint and they'll tell the father Whoa. that you need to rape what? Oh, your, man. your wife and then rape your, your kids too. Jeez. At gunpoint. And these are the stories that come out of places like this. Wow. Um, so it's like... And it's, that's... So what's happening right now in Tigray? Mm-hmm. And at the cleansing and things like that. Um, wow. You know, when Myanmar was happening with the ethnic cleansing in Myanmar, uh, the leader... I'm probably mispronouncing her name, but I believe her name was Aung Su Chi... Um, she she had a Nobel Peace Prize from years prior. Wow. So then you're like, why does she have a Nobel Peace Prize and there's ethnic cleansing going on in a country that she leads? Mm. And that's research. And I dive into that and try to learn as much as I can. So when you talked about ethics earlier in terms of journalistic ethics, can you describe, can you talk about that a little bit? Like, I in, think... Like, for photojournalism, I feel like it's very straightforward, right? Like, I know, like, for me, when, if you take a picture, you're not supposed to, like, go on Photoshop and, like, start masking stuff out. Mm. That's pretty obvious. Um, no over, you know, no, no, no editing where you're taking a picture of, like, if I take a picture of here, where it's going to look like something totally different. Mm. Um, that's just basic stuff. So being as objective and unaltering as possible. As possible. There will always be some editing because, of course, you put it in Lightroom and you're just doing, like, little tweaks and stuff, but nothing, you're not taking anything out. If there's a light pole coming out of somebody's head because you took it the wrong way, the light pole has to stay there. Oh. So then um, even, 
I guess even further down that line, what are the ethics of, um, I know that I used to take a lot of photos and I took a photo class at UNM with a guy and he said, go outside and like, just take photos of nature. And I remember I was going by McDonald's and I saw this homeless dude like munching on a, a burger and I turned, I was like, Hey, can I give you five bucks and take your photo? And he was like, yeah, sure, man. And I took his photo and I was just thinking like, that felt weird. <laughs> like, I don't know. It felt like I was, uh, like taking advantage of voyeur. Right? Yeah. I was like, I was like, uh, yeah, taking advantage or being voyeuristic on somebody else's life that's vulnerable. Mm, yeah. And, um, but then there's also the other side that I see you describe, which is beautiful, which is like there's a responsibility to tell the truth. Mm -hmm. And there's a responsibility to show what people won't typically see. Right. I think, and then we're also coming into another um, uh, issue or conversation that's happening in the photojournalism community is let's say you're wanting to take photos like National Geographic. Let's say, I think everybody knows uh, the famous picture by Steve McCurry uh, that graced the cover of National Geographic, Afghan Girl. Um, you know, what are the ethics of that? No. You're in uh, Afghanistan in a refugee camp and you take a picture of somebody who's, I think at the time, not of legal age, you know, and yes, the picture was amazing, but then you come back to America and you make millions of dollars off that right, yeah. and she is still to this day is yeah. pretty poor what what are the ethics of that how does that what does that do you know and those are questions that i don't have the answer to or i yeah. really think anybody does we can just mm -hmm. as a community we can just have the conversation have the least, conversation yeah. at least yeah um you know so for me like i think in gallup i would never i know there's something called the um ditch patrol in gallup and I did a photo uh, story on that uh, recently um, with a reporter um, named Richard Reyes, and he used to be the managing editor. He actually hired me, and then he stepped down as managing editor, and now he's just a reporter. Um, and one of the things that I was concerned about is like, oh, what are the ethics behind taking pictures of the, not the ditch patrol, but the people they pick up, which are usually intoxicated individuals who are like literally sleeping in ditches. Yeah. Um, you know, and the ditch patrol van doesn't look nice on the inside. It's literally a cage. Yeah. Um, so what are the ethics of that? So for me, I was like, oh, you know, I try not to get names or faces. And the thing was like, oh, we should get names and faces because they're in a public setting. And I'm like, oh, what happens if that messes up their life though? Like they, you know, right, yeah. Yeah. got a job interview for, uh, you know, six figure job the day before. <laughs> and then, but they're on the cover of the thing. Like, and, then, and then they ooh. got drunk. You know, just because and they're sleeping in a ditch and yeah. I take their photo, like, what are the ethics of that? And, um, you know, what are the ethics? And that's what I had to ask myself. So for me, I just decided to take back of the headshots and not ask names. Yeah. And if I did ask for a name, I'll just be like, so what's your real name? And they would tell me their real name, first and last name while they're kind of drunk. And then I'll be like, OK, do you want to give me? A name that's not yours. Yeah, do you have a <laughs> nickname that nobody do you else have knows. A nickname, yeah. and that's just that's because I, you know, and no one told me to do that. I think that's ethical. It, it makes yeah. sense. It yeah. makes sense, but then for the news, it's like like you want that person's real name and face, and that makes sense. But too. the news doesn't care. The news cares about the money, and they just close their eyes and go whatever, whatever's getting people to see. Right, it's fine, and and sometimes. It warrants, like, I know what's, let's go, if we go back to the Ukraine, uh, Lindsay Adario is a, sta um, a freelance photojournalist. She's worked for National Geographic, um, the UN, and now she's, uh, and she's done stuff for New York Times in the past, and now she's in the Ukraine um, as a freelancer for the New York Times, and she took a picture of, you know, a dead family, a literally kids, Dang. wife, and I think the father was there, and it, it, great, it, it was on the front page for a while um and she's like no we had this conversation you know they had, she's like they had a conversation in the office uh back in new york city because you know we were like oh is this too graphic to show and she's like but then we have to get the story across for what's actually happening in the right, ukraine yeah. yeah that makes sense um yeah. you know the war crimes that are happening in the ukraine right now they found uh uh dead bodies with uh with um their hands tied behind their back which is execution style execution and then that leads to war crimes mm -hmm. which this is 
that means that this war is um, is not following the Geneva Conventions or international law, which mm-hmm. I love international law. If I was going to be a lawyer, I'd be an international lawyer. Um, so then you have these things that are like a dystopian. Like that couldn't be happening well, now. Well, it can be. Humans are too advanced. No, to that I, tie I, somebody I, behind their back and shoot them in the head in the middle of the street. And that's that's literally happened last week. Yeah. Um. So then, for me, it's it's like a dystopian, um, paradox because you're 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 like, oh dang, like this stuff happens, but then who pays attention to it? Yeah. I mean, literally, like uh, in Gaza, you had um the ID. I believe it was the IDF. Uh, Israel blow up the AP building in Gaza. The AP is Associated Press. That's a news right. organization. Yeah. Through international law, you can't touch press. Press at all. Yeah, because press touch. is supposed to be a middle ground, and both sides need to respect right. that. And now, do they? Does America? You know, I was in Chicago and doing the doing the um, um, uh, Black Lives Matter protest, and I, we got. You know, people would attack, cops would touch us. You have video of people, journalists saying, I'm press, I'm press, holding mm-hmm. out their press cards. I'm press with a bulletproof vest that says press Dang. and big letters. And you have them getting pepper sprayed and arrested. Yeah. That shouldn't happen. But right. who's going to hold them accountable? Did anybody get held accountable in those situations? No. But and but that's a, that's not just like state law. Or you know our country law. That's international law. There should be some um, yeah. things to to protect, especially journalists when we're just doing our job. Yeah. Um, so that, that's something that I am passionate about. Maybe it's a part of because of the continued, uh, at least in the U.S., like a. I saw it even in Russian interviews where they would uh, a t- continued lack of trust invested into the concept of news being fake. Right. Right. Um, so. And that you, you saw a rise with, uh, you know, the Trump pres- presidency for yeah. fake news. Um, and so this is and it's been happening. You have it in other countries where I do think America usually would pride itself on like, oh, we treat our journalists right. You know, like they go to Afghanistan, and a journalist can get tortured and nothing would happen to, you know, whoever's torturing the whether it be the Taliban, uh, Al Qaeda or whatever, um, you know, beheading journalists. And then I'm like, well. You're not that far from that if you're a cop is beating you over the head with a billy club. Yeah. Um, because you said you're a journalist and somebody didn't listen. Because you're covering, yeah. So it, it's, it is what it is. But then at the same time, like these are the questions of like how far are we going to have to go to actually get some representation and safety? Yeah. Do you feel like there's like a new wave of journalism emerging that's less like hyper sensational and less clickbaity and more sort of authentic and trying to capture the truth? Or do you think it's always, there's always going to be that, you know, trying to get the clicks, trying to get the money, trying to get the views. I think when you look at, I think when you look at news today, one, you're, you have to draw a viewer's perspective. And the way to, I mean, if you look at, you know, the New York Times, Associated Press, you have to capture that. Because yeah. then the thing is right now, what's happening in America is most people don't read the news. I mean, when was the last time somebody read a newspaper? It's been a minute for me. I, I mean, I've read articles, but it's all going to be on last, like New York Times or, right. you know, whatever. But when was the last time somebody picked up a newspaper? I don't know if I I ever have. <laughs> right. Yeah. So that's the thing is like something like the Gallup Independent, which, you know, they don't really have a website. Oh, it's all print. It's all print. Okay. Or they do have a website. It's just. How do, how do. they ha- work well. How in the world do news organizations that are print still make money? That's a question that's beyond me. Dude, it's like there, have- there has to be some city or state or government grant money going into that because there's no. Profit in slow information. I think, but the thing is, with slow information, you have like I mean, for instance, let's let's use the Ukraine again. You have literally, uh, I believe her name is Erin Tribb. She's a, a photojournalist. I can't, I don't know if she's staff or a freelancer, but for the New York Times, and she had a for her Instagram story, she showed they were in, I think it was the town of Buka, 
Um, I'm probably pronouncing that wrong, but um, in the Ukraine. And she took a video of all these photographers, like literally hundreds, walking the streets of where these war crimes just happened. And like hundreds. And she's like, oh, these are these are press tours. And I'm like, you're in a war zone and you have one, two, three, four, five. Once I got over 10 in the video, I'm like, there are obviously more than 20, 30, 40 um, photographers and reporters running around trying to get stories. I'm like, what does that do, though? Because we're trying to get this fast information. Oh, what about now? What about tomorrow? When, you know, I really think slow information, especially for like photojournalism is the way to go, because if you can spend three months in Israel, you can get the you can get a good solid story mm -hmm. if you spend a year in Israel. It's going to be even more. Yeah. Um, but if you spend a week or a month, what does that mean? And like again, Ukraine is the popular thing now. Right. But in two months, you probably won't see headlines from it anymore. Mm -hmm. You'll see it, but it won't be as popular as it is now. Do you think that it'll still be the same amount of? violence or war going on but we I just mean, have been desensitized therefore it doesn't create the same visceral reaction in the in media or in, in the viewer so then we move on and have to have some other sensationalized thing i think we're already decent um desensitized to most things because we have you know these things yeah um just a phone <laughs> for the, for know, the right um um we, we, we have cell phones we have computers whereas when i was when i was growing up like i'm even desensitized because i can watch i, can, <laughs> I just I, realized know. what it could have been <laughs> we have these things like no one would have known sorry i just i'm slow today no problem we, we 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 have phones and things like that computers like i'm even desensitized because of i i loved watching um uh, what was happening in afghanistan and the thing is like I would watch beheading videos as a kid. Yeah. Because oh. I was like so interested in it. Like, I'm like, oh, like somebody got beheaded today. Who is it? Da 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 da. Oh, uh, there's something, there was something called Best Gore that I used to go on, which it had all those videos. And I would watch them and it wouldn't shake me. But then my mother, who was like, and my father, who was like, oh, dang, we didn't grow up with that. Like, a dead body on the news wasn't a thing. Da 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 da. Um, yeah. You know, this was like Columbo. You would have it was a big thing to have a, a chalk outline of a dead body. Oh my God, somebody's dead. Whereas now, that's like means nothing. Yeah. Um, like there was photos and videos of just dead bodies laying in Ukraine. Right. Just like so, and 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 that's that we're desensitized to that because we've seen it so much. Yeah. So then, when you do take the at least this is from my opinion. Um, when you do take and show dead bodies on the news, the question is, yes, you are showing what's happening as a historical documentation, but then what happens the next time that happens? And you show that, quote unquote, same picture somewhere else. It's not going to hit as hard. So that means the next time there's a war and I show, you know, somebody takes a picture, whether it's me or somebody else, of uh, four people dead on the side of the road because of a mortar bomb in some other country like Tigray or something like that. Oh, we saw that in the Ukraine a couple of years ago. OK, yeah. like I'm used to that. That's OK. Yeah. So now you're saying we have to uh, find a image that creates a more visceral reaction, a more visceral reaction. But then at the same time, like, what is that and how to find that is is hard i mean you're in a war zone as a photojournalist like your job's tough yeah um you're not you know like you can't sometimes you know it's it's not yeah easy. You, yeah you're playing with very sensitive information sensitive topics and right. trying to balance all of that while representing some semblance of truth of what's happening and then also trying to keep your mental sanity at the same oh, time yeah. <laughs> sure that's a whole other aspect um, yeah. which is if you talk to these people you know like I know Marcus Jam, uh, he's a photojournalist with the LA Times, and uh, if, if you hear him speak, they kind of call him like the last roving photojournalist or the last roving correspondent because he was in Azerbaijan for, I think, three to four months. Then he was in Afghanistan for three to four months. Then he was in Israel for three to four months. And then he was in the Ukraine. And this is the first time I saw him like do a post saying, oh, I need to take a break and I'm returning home because of health issues. Mm -hmm. Um which is like, that's not normal in the photo trolls community. The photo trolls community is very like, and it's moving away from this, but it's usually you go wherever the story is happening and you try and capture it. Yeah. Whether or not now mental health is becoming a, a conversation. And I'm not there yet where I can 
like be like, oh yeah, like I'm part of that conversation because I'm still so young and new, but I'm hearing it like, oh, what's your mental health? Like people even ask me who I talked to. I was talking to uh, John Trotter, who's a photojournalist with maps, uh, images. And he was like, you know, how's your mental health in Gallup? And I'm like, whoa, like, you know, like, I'm 23. <laughs> so, so like, you care about that? So like, and at first I'm like, when you care about that, I'm, I'm professional. So I'm like, I'm not, you know, trying to talk to you. About well, yesterday that. I uh, <laughs> broke down because, <laughs> but then at the same one time, McDonald's. <laughs> then at the same time, like I can go, I'm also young. And again, I'm desensitized. So I can go and cover uh quote unquote heinous murder in Gallup or somebody dead or see a dead body and totally be fine. And I'm not sure if I'm actually fine, but then I'm like, I also feel like that's part of the job. Do you sleep well at night? I think I saw some stuff in Israel that really shook me and like, I'm still dealing with it today. And sleeping well is like interesting to me because I'm like, what is, what, what, what is sleeping well? What does that mean? Because I'm a thinker. I'm alone most of the time. I also talk a lot too. Because I'm alone most of the time. So when I get around people, I talk a lot. Um, I have a lot of time to think. So, yeah, I, I, I'm dealing with some stuff that I saw in Israel. Um, and it wasn't anything that, like, I didn't expect. But it's also kind of weird for me because, like, I was happy to be there. If that makes sense. Like, you're happy to be in tear gas and be a part of that. But then this bad thing is happening in front of you. But yeah. I, for me, it was an overwhelming feeling of like, I have a responsibility to be here and tell this story um, or at least capture it because I'm not sure if I can tell it since I'm so young and, you know, I'm still learning. But then at the same time, I'm like, dang, I'm finally here. Like for me to be like, dang, I'm finally here was like something that was cool for me because I'm like, oh, like I'm one of these people who now I can go back and say I've had this experience of like, being in tear gas with my camera and photographing that and having to work through that. So like, I'm proud of the scars all physically and emotionally, mentally I've gotten yeah. because it shows the 12 year old kid who's like always looking at Nat Geo and New York times like, Oh, like you want to be part of that. And now I've had that experience and I'm proud of it. So whatever comes with it, I'm totally willing to accept the lack of sleep, the yeah. like sitting there, I could see your brain start to go back to those moments even, you know, while you're thinking about it, the pauses and stuff. It's like, right. And it, it is, I would say to, to call it a privilege feels weird to me because I am like, Oh, like this is something that's bad. That's happened. And like people actually suffered from that, mm -hmm. but I'm appreciative of the privilege of that. I was there mm -hmm. when I was in Egypt and I saw the brick layers, which is now like, um, a humanitarian issue <laughs> that has taken so long when I was there. You you saw literally somebody like uh, cutting salt and they use these old rusty like cutters to cut this, these salt blocks and they're pushing it through and some guy's arm got cut off literally oh right gosh. in front of me and I'm like, wow, like I actually, and, and like I'm like, oh dang, that's that's rough. But then I'm like, should, should I take a picture or should I just step aside and that's hard because you're like, oh, like somebody's in pain and agony. I right. can't do anything to help. Yeah. Did you take a picture? No. Oh. Um, because I thought it was unethical. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's such a interesting line to tell. It's just when do you pull out your camera? Your well, career you are, is literally based on that instance right. too. Yeah. yeah, it really is. So you're you're like, like, I think it's which one do you value more? Do you value some version of success? Because right. the thing is, like, at that age, right now, just having a picture of some guy and his arm cut off. And yeah. I would have to be crouching, getting his eyes in focus and things like that. Yeah. I feel like that's insensitive. Yeah. Um, if I was laying on the ground, what I would somebody doing that to me, I would understand why. But yeah. then I'm like. But you're you. <laughs> yeah, but I'm right. a me. And You'd smile for him. <laughs> you, you know, you do the thumbnail. <laughs> you know, so I, I, at the same time, it it, it it comes down to 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 ethics, and I feel like every person has to tell that line, and that line is sometimes will be pushed, and sometimes yeah. it, it won't be, and that's okay. So, but, a question with that photo: Would in your decision making mechanism, would you look at that and say, if I took this photo, would this represent something bigger than just this pain? of this individual right now that oh, it would, would help cause change. It, it probably would, but at the same time, I wasn't there. Yeah. Like, as I go through this career, I'm mm, also maturing. In right, life. totally. So it's not just like, 
I have all the answers for everything or I've really experienced much. It's like I've experienced a little because I'm 23 years old and yeah. I'm still going to be learning a year from now. I'm going to be learning 20 years from now. Um, you know, hopefully I'm more successful in 20 years and hopefully I'm like, you know, the, you have some of my goals ticked off of like big photojournalistic dreams. But at the same time, I think th the thing that I want to be known for as somebody who can tell a story passionately, delicately, and who people actually want around. And I also do want to learn how to be invisible as a photojournalist because that's when you do get those amazing shots is yeah. when you can be invisible. Mm -hmm. And that's something I'm learning now in Gallup. It's like, oh, like, you know, you make rookie mistakes and those mistakes are okay. Like, oh, I forgot to, you know, the Sony A9 II has a silent shutter. Oh, you forgot to turn that off while this... Uh, super secret important Navajo ceremonies going off and you just distracted the medicine man from chanting Dang. <sighs> like th those are things you actually learn and yeah. you walk around and you're like fuck like that was a rookie mistake like mm. the picture I could have gotten and then I have to correct myself and be like hey I'm learning and like you yeah. talk to all these professionals enough where you're like okay everybody makes that mistake though. oh yeah yeah those are you your know? stripes man right it's like, and those and, build and, you yeah and you give those gifts to other people to be like hey make sure you turn your silent Right. Shut her on. And, and, and it's something that sounds dumb. And you're like, yeah, who would forget that? But everybody does. Yeah. Um, yeah. And that's only with, I believe, in like making mistakes and learning from them and trying not to repeat them again. And that's literally what photojournalism is. Or any anything somebody wants to be successful in, it's are you willing to look dumb and make those mistakes? Mm-hmm. And I'm, you know, people who know me, they're like, Will is willing to look like a stupid fool. <laughs> um, no, and I'm, really I am because if I want something, I'll ask for it. I'll be like, hey, can you help me? Yeah. I know like when I was in school, everybody was like, oh, how do you do that? Like, are you just rich or like what? And I'm like, no, like, you know, like I'm just a regular person. I just ask. Yeah. You know, at Double Eagle, like people would take me fly and teach me how to fly with my extra super duper thick ass glasses. <laughs> and, you know, like legally, I'm not supposed to be able to fly. Really? You have to have like a certain- You have to have 20-20 uh, vision, I think. Really? I didn't know Correctable that. if you have glasses. I don't have that with my thick ass glasses. But, so you just asked, hey, can I tag along? Yeah. Really? I do that with everything. Yeah. Literally, like with everything. Everything I, I just ask. Hmm. And I've done that my whole, because I remember I was raised by parents who were like, if you don't ask, you don't get. Yeah. <laughs> like, so I ask. I'm always like, well, like, if like sure i know i can work hard for it but like would it go faster if i just went up to a pilot and be like hey <laughs> can you can you take me can up? i skip all the years of training and getting, <laughs> and can, yeah, can you, getting can, to know the right people can you can you just take me up and teach me and most of them are just old dudes and they'll be like yeah most yeah most like people especially i feel like at least in my world in the film world that's something that people don't get is it's ask. like just ask, ask if you want to do something i was talking to my buddy enrique and he's like uh He's doing really well for he's young. He's like your age and he's already like coordinating films like right which is like a position That takes years for people to get it right and he's just like already doing it And he's like yeah, the reason is because I was just a PA and then I asked and I yeah. said hey Can I do this on the next one? I think I could do it and they're like yeah, sure, but to ask you have to be able to stand Rejection and I feel like that's the, that's the big fear is fear of rejection and I so I feel like people don't put themselves in a Vulnerable place to get hurt and I I mean I'm speaking for myself, right? You don't want to feel embarrassed You don't want to you don't want to hear somebody say mm, no or feel uncomfortable or awkward So you're right. just like I just don't ask and then right. you don't have to feel that that bad feeling again yeah. I, I think most of the things that I did like just throughout my life was from asking and I remember in Israel, um, you know, you're you're trying to make connections with other photojournalists and journalists and things like that. So I think um, <laughs> I had a connection here in Albuquerque because everybody wants to work for New York Times or the AP or something. Mm -hmm. But the journalism students at UNM, I don't think they know that there's a, um, a Associated Press Bureau here in Albuquerque. Is so it the I, Albuquerque Journal? It's, they have share the same building with the Albuquerque Journal, the Associated Press. It's a team of, like, at the time, it was four people in a small room for the Associated Press in Albuquerque. I didn't know there was AP here. Exactly. Interesting. And so I look up their masthead, and I'm just, like, looking where they have places close to me. There was one in Arizona, and I'm like, oh, I don't have a car. I only have a bike. 
because like I left my car at home because I wanted to be a biker for my whole college career. <laughs> and so I'm like, where can I? I can't bike to Arizona, or maybe I could, but it would take me a couple of days. And <laughs> no. so then I see Albuquerque, or I see New Mexico, and I call the number. And they're like, yeah, we're sharing a building with the ABQ Journal. I go down there and I'm like, hey, uh, you know, I'm calling. No one picks up, and they're just like, okay, William, like. We'll get in touch with you. I think the yeah. lady's, lady's name was Susan Montoya, and they're like, she's super busy. Um, you know, she was like the leader of the four people at the AP Bureau. And I'm like, okay, I would call like every day for, I want to say a month. Dang. And then so the guy who would keep, keep picking up, his name was Russell Contreras, who now works at Axios. Um, and, you know, he was like, hi, William. Like, I recognize <laughs> your number. Um, and I was like, hey, dude, like, I'm, I'm a f- you know, an emerging photojournalist. <laughs> can, can you can can uh can you meet me? Like I'm trying to like get a job so I can make money as a photographer because like my parents told me that if I'm gonna be a photojournalist, I'm not gonna make any money. And he's like, that's true. Um, like most photojournalists don't make a lot of money, but like, how much do you want to make? And I was like, oh, like by the time I'm 30, I would like to make like 150 thousand dollars off taking photos. And he's like, yeah, you can come down to the AP. So I'm bike down there, or I, I, it's either I bike or I take my girlfriend's car. I was like, "Hey, can I borrow your car?" Um, but I think I bike that day, and um, so I'm biking. You know, Albuquerque is not that great for bikers. You know, almost get hit a couple of times <laughs> and pull up, and the guys, I'm like, "Hi, I'm outside because the door is locked," and um he's like okay like just park your car and i'm like i'm on a bike and he's like where do you bike from and i'm like i don't know it took me like two and a half hours um like i bought bike from lobo village and he's like okay you know i come in with my bike and i'm all sweaty because it's hot <laughs> summer day and take off my helmet and sit down he's like yeah this is this is the office it's four four of us and i'm like wow can I have a job? And you're like, this is not what I imagined. But right. Can this I is not what this? I imagined, yeah. but but can I have a job? And he's like, the AP doesn't take freelancers. I'm like, no, 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 a staff job. And he's like, <laughs> I'm like, I'm a sophomore, but like, I can do it. Like, just give me a chance. And he's like, what I can do is like, help you along your journey as you progress. I can kind of be there for you. So I was like, so so no money, no job. And he's like, <laughs> He's like, no, no job. Like, we, we can't do that. He's like, if, you know, if this was 1960, like, you have the balls to come down and ask for a job. Yeah. Like, you would have one. And that's how photojournalists did it back in the time. They would just go and ask. Dang. And be like, hi, I can take pictures. And they would get a job. So then when I'm in Israel, I'm like, hey, Russell, I'm in Israel. I'm trying to, like, figure things out. Like, I'm staying at a... He's like, where are you staying? Like, isn't that expensive? I'm like, yeah. I'm staying at a hostel. Like... I have to clean like a couple toilets to like get like free f- free room and board and sometimes food. And he's like, "Okay, like you're really going for it." And I'm like, "Yeah, like I know there's an AP bureau here in Israel. Can you get me in contact with somebody? Like I know I, there's something that says bureau chief and his name's Joe Fetterman. And he's like, "Oh yeah, like I'll send an email to Joe." And so I get in contact with Joe Fetterman and I'm like, you know, going there. And I'm like, you know, first couple 30 seconds, he's like, oh, hey, what are you doing? I'm like, can I have a job and an assignment from the Associated Press? And he's like, you know, I'm sitting down. He gets up and he's like, hold on. And closes his office door. And he's like, we don't do that. And like, how old are you? And I'm like, oh, like I, I was like 20, 21. I'm like, oh, I'm 21, like 20, 21, like, you know. And he's like, <sighs> like looking at me like I'm the most stupid person ever. And I'm like, I like all. And he's like, so why would you ask that? And I'm like. Well, because I, it's my dream to, like, work for one of these indus- in this industry. And, like, the only way I'm going to learn is by being around photojournalists who are better than me. And I'm yeah. like, you guys have people like Oded Belidi, who won the Pulitzer Prize in f- 2015. And I'm naming everybody. <laughs> I know who's, like, b- a big shot photojournalist. And I'm like, yeah, like, you know, it'll be amazing. And he's like, no, but, like, I can be a contact for you. And, like, I can have you meet. Oh, dead Belidi and like ask him if he's willing to meet with you. And I'm like, okay, cool. Like I already messaged him over Instagram several times and he hasn't answered. And I messaged his Facebook. I also found Dang. his email off somewhere, but like he hasn't answered me and he's like, I'll get in touch with him. Oh, dead answers. But then like I'm there. That was like my second week in Israel and I was there for three months. Mm-hmm. And then on the last day I get to meet with uh Pulitzer prize winning. Oh, dead Belidi. And all he's, he's like, Oh yeah, you're young. Like just shoot more. 
That's what he says. Just shoot more. <laughs> Just shoot more. Because he's like, you know, I won the Pulitzer Prize. And he tells me this story that I take to heart. He's like, I won the Pulitzer Prize. And he's like, I stopped having a passion for it. And he's <laughs> like, because at that point it was a job. And he's like, you'll, when he's like, you, when you have your first staff job in America, he's like, at some shitty newspaper, he's like, you'll feel that way too. And he's like, but I won the Pulitzer Prize in 2015. And he's like, they sent me everywhere. They sent me to China. Like, I was, he's like, I was the top dog. And he's like, I stopped practicing. And he's like, I lost my eye. Whoa. And for a photojournalist to say that, everybody knows what that means because everybody's like, oh, you have a good eye. Or like work on your eye more. That's saying like composition, things like that. Like, can you naturally find that with your eyes? And so he's like, I lost my eye. And so for Odin Belita to say he lost his eye, he still doesn't have it back. <laughs> But this dude is working for the Associated Press, and his con and the stuff he takes pictures of is still pretty amazing. And he's saying he lost his eye, but then when I used study before the Pulitzer Prize and when he was in China, that eye was like still there. And then what he has now, you saw that he lost it. So you I, could I actually he, see it. You could actually see it. That like, he lost it in his work. Interesting. Um, but that's from studying it too and knowing what that stuff is supposed to look like. Like if. Any, if I took a random person off the street, they'd be like, oh, yeah, that's so great. And it is. It's amazing. So for him to say he lost his eye is fucking creepy because his stuff is still fucking amazing. <laughs> um, you know, and again, it's just asking. I'm like, oh, can you be in contact, contact for me? And he's like, oh, I'm busy. But like, sure, send me your stuff every once in a while. And I, to this day, I still send him stuff. You know, he reads it. It says red. And he sends me a thumbs up. But he doesn't really say anything more than that. I don't know um, if he can really do anything more than that, other than be a voice of your victory. Right. You know, he, he, he really says he's like, like you if know, you write a book or you put out an up thing, he probably would be willing to like say right. something about it. But right. And, 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 and he's, he's, and he's like, you know, like, he's like, this is on, like he, he all these people are like, this is on you. Like mm -hmm. we can't do anything. We can't give you a job. Like, you know, and everything's so freelancing now too, like right. because it's easier for people just to take the best stuff. Right. Because National Geographic has never had a staff photographer, for my knowledge. Yeah. It's all been freelance. So then, you know, going to being in Israel, going back to asking is like I got to shadow a Tiff Safadi, who's a chief photo, who is the chief photojournalist of the European Press Photo Agency Bureau in Israel, just because I asked, and I was like, hey, like. Can I, can I, uh, like, like I, there's a, what was there? There was an application for an internship and I was like, I missed it cause I was traveling and like, I didn't know about it, but like, I'm here and whoever you accept for the internship won't be here. And for another like three months, but I'm here now and I'm in front of you. Like he met me for coffee after begging this dude for like three weeks to meet me for coffee. And he finally does. And you know. He's a cool looking dude. He has like these Harry Potter glasses and everything like that. And he's older, you know, he's like in his forties or fifties or something. And he's like, you can shadow me on a couple of assignments. And I'm like, <sighs> you know, I'm just like amazed by that because I'm like, dang, like this is my opportunity. And they're small assignments. And I got to see like some really cool stuff, like the protests and the fighting between the Palestinians and the Jews and the IDF and things like that. And I, you know, he even wrote me a letter of recommendation after begging dang. him to do it. Okay. But like, I'm like, dang, like that's something that I remember that asking and being humble and being like, I don't know anything, but I yeah. feel like I can make a difference in the world. Mm -hmm. That's how I feel in my heart. But I don't, I'm, I'm, I'm totally fine with saying like, I don't know anything. I'm a beginner mm. um, because I am. And when I'm not a beginner, I still want to, be able to function like a beginner with passion and just like how I'm talking now and probably over talking. <laughs> no, it's That's great. I really appreciate is, it. You're, you're is, very bold and I, I definitely respect that is, 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 is being passionate. And I think like, you know, being in Gallup, like I've struggled with keeping the stoke alive, mm, Yeah, you know, like, cause you know, it's not that busy. Like I'm not on assignment every day. I could be, but then like the newspaper has limited budget and everything like that. And that's not bad, but it just teaches you how to like, oh, what are you going to do for your own assignments? Like mm -hmm. tomorrow I'm going out to the McBrid fire in Rue Doso mm -hmm. with no support and like $95 in my bank account, probably less because like I have to eat today. So it'll probably be something like 50. So like, ooh, dang, like 
I have forty five dollars in food in one day. Well, I'm, I'm, you know, I, 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 my friend's birthday is coming up and stuff, so I'm like trying to be responsible. But then I'm like, oh, like I need to buy him something for his birthday. So that's dude. There I we just go. I just bought a a EMF hood. What is that? You put it on your head and it stops electromagnetic frequencies. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Why? I was on YouTube last night and I saw uh, Duncan Trussell and Joe Rogan talking oh, about I it. Did see that. And I looked and I was like, dude, that would be tight to sleep with so the aliens don't get in my wow, brain. Dude, you're going deep, aren't dude, you? Sure? No, I just figured like if I walked around with a cloak all the time, like <laughs> how cool would that be? Joe Rogan is, his podcast is very. I, I know people have bad things to say about it, but at the same time, I'm like, but it's information. Yeah. That's it, the end of it. Like, yeah. Why are we trying to say it's like red pill or whatever, or like, you know, some political leaning stuff when it's just like it's information. And like the people he interviews are really cool people. Yeah. Like they're really different. They're educated most of the time. Most of the time. They, and they even when they're not, educated in a field, whether that's right. something that's uh, scholastic or something that's comedy based or something that's entertainment right. based. Like they're usually really good at what they're they at do. like the right. peak of their field. Right. Yeah. So the, I like it's it's amazing. I like that stuff. But yeah. Yeah. I think that that's the value that I'm trying to build in this is too, is like just information, just right. like yeah. non-biased, just like this person feels this way and this is what they've believed and this is what brought them to that. And the next guest might think completely different. Yeah. Right. And that's okay because if we're scared of making our own decisions about information, then we're giving other people the ability to make our cognitions for us. And that's like, yeah. I'm not into that. Right. And I really appreciate like different perspectives. Yeah. Because I know, like, even in Gallup, like, I know a new experience that I had was, like, being invited to the mosque, mosque there, which is, when I first came to Gallup, I was like, there's a mosque. And I, like, called them and asked them, like, can I come by and photograph? And they were like, no. And then, so now I've made a name for myself of, like, the the uh, imam or the sheikh uh, said to me, like, the Navajo people say, like, <laughs> you're the photographer of the people. And I'm like... I don't feel that way. I feel like I'm messing up and making mistakes and everything. He's like, but they talk about you really well. He's like, the guys you go to the sweat lodge with, Elmer. And I'm like, dang, how do you know these people? Hmm. And he's like, well, I don't. They kind of just like, you talked about this with them. So they gave me a call on your behalf. And I'm like, whoa, whoa, that's a big deal. He's like, so like, I'm inviting you out to be come down to, 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 to photograph uh, our mosque and us and things like that. And whoa. so. For me, like being in the Middle East and things like that and coming back and having that, like hearing the call to prayer and everything was like, I was like, it brought tears to my eyes because wow. I'm like, oh, dang, yeah. I remember that and that feels mm. good. And just photographing like their head touched the ground in the mosque yeah. was a really beautiful experience. And, you know, when I talk to them and I say Israel, they're like, Palestine, they correct me. <laughs> um, Palestine, not yeah. Israel. And I'm like, well, it depends on who you talk to. And they're like, but it's Palestine. And I'm like, okay. Yeah, like, okay. <laughs> I'm not going to disagree with you because I actually do agree with you. But then also if I was talking to somebody who was like, oh, it's Israel, I would agree with them too. Yeah. And that's how I really feel. Yeah. Because I'm like, I'm not going to choose sides. I don't think you can. And I don't think it's a responsibility as a journalist or, you know, definitely as a journalist. Photojournalist, you kind of have more leeway but i think like you shouldn't choose jobs as a photojournalist either the pictures should speak for themselves yeah yeah um and i think <laughs> most of my friends have learned that being a photojournalist has become more of my personality than anybody else's job probably in the world <laughs> because i'm like i'm a photojournalist like somebody asked me who's william and i'm like i'm a photojournalist like it's become yeah that's awesome yeah it's become well, you know what you what you are, right? I know. A lot of people take years to right. figure out who they are. Yeah. It's right. like, and I would even say, I honestly, I'm 23. I don't know who I am. I know what I want to do. Yeah, there's a difference in my mind of like knowing who I am versus like what I want to do. Well, that'll yeah. make titling this video a lot easier on Levi and I's part because we'll just put <laughs> William Dash photojournalist. Right. <laughs> well, let's. Do you guys want to dive into like? That stuff, photojournalism. I mean, sure. sure. Yeah. yeah. I mean, we, I don't know we, we are here. Been, we're here but. for you. <laughs> yeah, we're here for you, brother. What do you? What do you? I don't know. What do you guys want to know? What's when um, when, you, when when you invited me on this podcast? Like, uh, how does the camera work? <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I feel like we're just we're just getting to know people and kind right. of going back to like you know the Joe Rogan blueprint. Right. 
that's like people at their like i was saying the, the peak of their field but there's also people here in albuquerque and people that are accessible to levi and i mm -hmm. that we can give a voice to that oh they've never been on a podcast or they you know they have a really cool experience that they want to share you know of course we're very humble we're very small like this is we're we're building right now right uh but we're just getting to know people and so getting to know william the photojournalist and then getting to know you know like we, we'll have people that we know but right uh we want to we want to have new conversations we want to have different perspectives right and so having you on you know i don't think there was like a specific point we were trying to get at with having okay, you right. on we just wanted to we just wanted to chat with you that's right? cool that's cool yeah. that's cool i think um for me what's really exciting is yeah building this platform where people can share their opinions we just cut that camera because that one died the battery so yeah, whatever okay camera. There we go. <laughs> um, what I was going to say really quickly was I think I'm really excited about this podcast because it's something that we'll be building and your career will be building and then you can come back on if you want it or we can, right. totally. you know what I mean? And we'll continue to build and we're just giving a platform and a voice for artists to connect and understand who's out there. Right. Because a lot of artists don't know who's out there, who's around us. And I think that that's what really excites me is because through this, I've been able to connect so many of my friends together that are awesome and love the same things. And that's a piece that I think New Mexico is going to love. Right. I, and I totally agree with that. In the photojournalism community, there are, since I came to Gallup, I remember being in school and I was like, there are no photojournalists in New Mexico. Mm. And, the, you know, it was pretty spry. And then now I'm seeing like New Mexico on the New York Times and there's a girl named Adrian Malcolm and I'm like, can I meet with you on a Sunday? Cause like I want to freelance because like, yes, a staff job is stable, but you don't necessarily get to do the stories you want to do. Mm -hmm. So I'm like freelancing is on the other side where it's really risky and you could not be able to pay rent one month or a couple months, <laughs> but you get to do the stories you want to do. Yeah. So for yeah. me, I'm like, I would rather be able to do the stories I want to do yeah. all the time and just pick up and go. And, you know, maybe just have to live in my van for a couple months. Yeah. Um, you know, so. I will say very quickly, you're so good with names. Like, you're, it seems like you can just remember everybody's first and last name. And then you could just, like, uh, you know, get to that part of your brain. And you just, like, remember their people. Like, yeah. You Have you ever smoked <laughs> you <just> weed? Like, <laughs> huh? Have you ever smoked weed? <laughs> I have, yes. Okay. Why? Checking. What does that mean? Because <laughs> I, I used to smoke a ton of weed, and I feel like my memory's shot because of that. Oh, I've only done it uh, three times in my life. Okay. So I'm like, one of them was like a couple weekends ago, but Ooh. like I was like, mm, this is nice. I'm, like, <laughs> I'm not. You're I'm not, not a I'm, regular. Right. I'm not a regular or anything like that. You know. Um, you know. I, I I believe in like again like it's legal now it's legal now in but New is, Mexico. It, is it federally legal no, no. not yet so yeah. that's that's my thing but it's so. getting passed through i what the senate or whatever i don't know i think if you work at something like the cia or something like that or yeah, you'll probably scary. be like because you can't like fall into psychosis and work at the cia like, right it's not gonna play <laughs> you know which is they'll do a drug test for that but yeah um yeah i don't know like i think it's uh yeah i i think it's it's a nice way to bond with people you it's know. like the sweat lodge. It re it it really is, and yeah. that's I was I was sm I smoked weed with with, with with my friend, two of my friends, and it was just like, oh wow, this is like a bonding moment. Yeah, you don't want to do the sweat lodge every single day, right? You want to do the sweat lodge once every few weeks, once a month, you know, right? You and just have it as a ceremony. And it feels really good, and you're like, oh, this is something special. And I feel like most people, as humans, we take stuff for granted the more it's around yeah so use I, it as a tool i think it, it's it's about people too if you have your best friend there by your side all the time you're gonna take him or her for granted whereas if you see them that person once a month that's yeah, true you're gonna be like yeah oh dang so like for me it, it's great that i have friends in albuquerque but i'm not here that much so then when they see me like i feel appreciated and i can appreciate them and i think that's something that's beautiful even like <laughs> this is gonna sound funny funny but most of my friends are like, what? Like, you know, like if I have a partner, I want to live separate from them because I feel like that's important for me to have my own space and for yeah. them to have theirs. And then we come together at certain times and that's okay. I feel like that's a very, um, 
what am I saying? Like a modern way, maybe. I don't know. I've just been hearing that pretty frequently about relationships. Like, like I want my life and you have yours and then we come together. Right. And I'm like, I don't know if it works, but it sounds cool to me. You right. know, like, cause you can like continue your independence, but also there's a beautiful thing about sacrificing for a partner or, or having that closeness that you are one, like you right. and Emily are like, like, that's not, I don't know. That doesn't seem like the case. <laughs> so I think we're, I mean, once a kid comes, it kind of changes the role. So, and so I feel like now it's becoming more a little bit of I have my thing that I do and then she has her thing. But we, we you know, we're always coming back and forth and we're, we're so intertwined in each other's lives. But we're still we're still one team, but we're just I'm focused on this and you're focused on that. Right. It's both. Yeah. It, it's gonna benefit both of us, you know, in the long haul. And you're 26. I'm 26. Yeah. And you, you're like for sure having a kid come. Like she's pregnant. Oh, I already have a kid. Yeah. Oh. Okay. Yeah, I have a one year old. Yeah. Wow. See, and my parents had the three of us at 27, and my parents like had only been with each other, and they got married at like 18. Mm. For me, like I was like, dang, getting married at 18, like. Yeah. Being so in, they were together for nine years before they had kids. Right. So then, uh, you know, the thing is, like, for me, like, I was just in a relationship that I just got out of, and I'm just like, wow, if I was going to get married now, like, I feel like I could do it, but I'm like, that just seems, I don't know, it, it seems like so out of reach, if that makes sense. I well, don't know you kind of seem sense. like you're on a, a, you know, a life path of your own, and maybe right. that doesn't look like getting married and settling down, because you, you, you have you have you have stuff to do, you know? You have right, right. Places it's, it's, to travel to. And it's like, just, bringing somebody else in, you would have to sacrifice what you're doing. And, and I that's, did. Yeah. And right. I think I did, and I remember, like, like now, like, for me, like, I think just, just for me, like, getting out of a relationship, and, 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 and it's been a year, but it's, like, just, like, getting back into fitness again, and, like... You gonna come to the climbing gym? <laughs> I love the climbing gym, dude. I, that's not an answer. <laughs> Am I going to come? Am I? Yes, I will come. Okay, you'll come, come with me. All right. Yes, um, <laughs> I will message you next time I'm down. I'll be like, we're going to Stone okay. Age. Stone, right. I used to bike to Stone Age every day Dang. and totally not handle my school because I was at the climbing gym. Yeah, and yeah. my parents were pissed because they're like, if you get A's, we'll pay for it. Well. There's one dang. semester that I had to pay for it, and I don't. <laughs> I was like, "Dang, whoa, whoa!" But you got those V sixes. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. I was a lead climber, so I was like, "Oh, really? Yeah, Dude, yeah, yeah." Lead climbing's trippy. <laughs> I love. I like lead. I I can lead, but I just bouldering is just so you're so. I always saw you know the guys with their shirts off and they're just shredded, and I'm like, "Yeah." And then you see the little little groms come in, the yeah. little kids. Like, Dude, yeah. the kids just fly, up. and they're just like. You know, I'm doing something. The kids are like, "Hey, can I try?" And I'm like, "Sure." Six year old, and they're yeah. just like, they're like putting their head it. above their or their foot above their head, and like. <laughs> well, this kid, he, he literally just went on, and he was just campusing it, no feet, no. And I'm like, "Yeah." When they do that, I grab him by the leg and I pull him <laughs> off. You know, I'm so. just and jumps down. They're like, "That's easy," and they're like looking at you like, "I'm like you." You're like, like I have more <laughs> weight to pull. <laughs> yeah. You're making excuses. Wait till you for hit yourself. puberty, kid. <laughs> You're making Good luck. excuses for yourself. <laughs> it's just. Yeah. Amazing. No, I remember when I was young, I used to flip around all over the place. And oh, yeah. Once I, like, gained some muscle mass, it was so much harder. Right. Yeah. I, I remember, like, back in Canada, it was just, like, I was always wanted to be in the outdoor so much that I would know my parents. I was like, when are we going somewhere? Let's go, let's go, let's go, let's go, let's go, let's go. Like, canoeing, kayaking, camping, nice. um, just anything. Because it was, like, I mean, we were in British Columbia. That's literally, like, when you... you I would say, like, I've traveled a lot, but that's still one of the most beautiful places in the world, is British right. Columbia, is you can literally leave your house and kayak or canoe in, you know, the ocean, basically, and you can see a whale Dang. right under you and jump in and be friends with a whale <laughs> wow. for, like, five minutes. And that was the thing that I grew up with, and I'm like... Dang, like I, I took it for granted because I was like, oh, I'm so bored. Like I've already done that, and now I'm like, dang, I should just move to British Columbia and go swim uh, with whales. You know, that the, sounds amazing. It, it, it. I mean, I don't. I again, I took it for granted. So now that I see the experiences that I've had that I've taken for granted, which are numerous and a lot, I'm just like, dang, I wish I could go back 
and relive those and be more appreciative. What's the line from The Office? I wish you knew what the good times were when you're in the good times or something. Right. Anyways. I don't know. Uh, to button this podcast up, I have a question. I don't know if you have any other thoughts, but um, what drives your curiosity? What do you mean? What Like, how did I get my curiosity or what? Yeah, however you want to take that. Because, I mean, you're describing this desire to go swim with whales, this desire to go to Israel, the desire to do sweat lodges. This thing that's pushing you through this curiosity. I, I, you're, you're so easy with discomfort for curiosity. And I think that that's a very unique trait. I really think it came from my parents. Like, you know, shout out to my parents. But, yeah. like, it's... It's, it's, uh, I don't know. I was that kid and they were just like super supportive and we went through our hard times. Like, Oh, you're not going to make any money as a photographer or like you're going to go to her school for photography. Like that's something you don't need to go to school for. We're paying all this money and that stuff we had to learn through and stuff like that. But it came from my parents because like, I'm literally what I think like it's a culmination of my parents to me. And I think things come down through your blood My mom wanted to be a war journalist and she wanted to go to war zones, but then she had kids. So she's like, oh, I don't want to do that. So then she was just a lawyer. Um, And then just a lawyer, you know, big deal. Yeah. (laughs) And and then my dad, you know, he wanted to be a photographer, but he's like, oh, I couldn't support a family of five on. (laughs) So they both wanted to be a photographer or a journalist. My dad, my mom wanted to be a journalist writing in like broadcasting, like you see uh, Clarissa Warden do on CNN. Wow. And then my dad wanted to be like a photographer because he's like, oh, I saw Nat Geo. So then like they never said anything to me. So then I'm like, I want to be a photojournalist. (laughs) And like literally, I remember the day I said it, it was uh, uh, like, I think it was the time Jimmy Chin had his first cover of Alex Honnold Mm -hmm. on the side of Yosemite. And I was like, I've been reading Nat Geo, and I'm like, oh, cameras, I love that. Da, 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 da. Like every month it would come in the mail, and you get in the little plastic thing. I'll rip it off, and I'll be so excited, and I would smell it. Whoa. And it would just be, nat- it smelled like Nat Geo. Yeah. It smelled like adventure. Um, and so I remember when I decided I want to be a photojournalist, it was the day that um, I got that Nat Geo in the mail, and it was Jimmy Chin's photo of Alex Honnold on the side of Al Cap in his red shirt. And I think he had like shorts on, like beige shorts or something like that. I was like, I want to do whatever that is. Yeah. Wow. I want to do whatever that is. Like, what whatever these people do, I want to do it. Yeah. And so then it just led me to being like, I was like, how do I do that? And it just led to me being, you got to be curious about everything. And like when I was 12 years old, I would call people like Nicole Tung, who's in the Ukraine right now. And uh, she actually has a long history in the, in the, in the, and the photo journals community of. I think we're still good. Oh, yeah, because we broke it. Yeah. Okay. Of the way we, uh, you know, of the way people use freelancers, because when James Foley died and got beheaded, like that changed the whole landscape of photojournalism. And for me, seeing that, it just was like, be curious. And I would call these people, find their numbers on the internet, find their numbers on Instagram, because at that time, people put phone numbers on Instagram. Oh. And, you know, you could look at their profile and stuff. And I would call them and be like, oh, hey, my name is William Weaver. And they're like, are you part of, like, some media agency or something like that? And I'm like, no, I'm 12 years old. (laughs) Can can I come to the Central African Republic for you? I have no money. I have, like, a point-and-shoot camera, but I feel like I can make a difference. Whoa. And that was that. And, like, do you guys know who Chris Burkhardt is? No. No. So he's a famous adventure photographer. And... Like he lit, he has a studio in Pismo Beach. And I remember me and my family were like traveling around the US and we were near Pismo Beach. And I was like, can we go? And I asked him for an internship over Instagram. And I was like, can you just give me an internship? And this was before, now he does internships, but this was before that. And I was like, can you give me an internship? I'm like 14 years old. Wow. Like, just give me a year internship. I will sleep in your studio. Wow. And my parents were like, what? no you're not gonna do that (laughs) like hell no and i'm like no but seriously like this could boost my career and everybody just was like oh just be curious and just don't take no for an answer and so i was talking to this one guy and i'm like so when you say just don't take no for an answer and i'm like 13 when you say don't take no for an answer does that mean like since you said no i'm supposed to accept that you won't take me to istanbul with you and pay for me and everything and he's like Yes, but I'm still not going to do it. But don't take no for an answer. Because he was, knew he was talking about a 13-year-old, and I would try and yeah. finagle my loopholes and everything. And he's like, you're smart. Just keep doing that. Yeah. 
And so well, it's always been this curiosity to just be places. And that comes from my parents. As they were like, literally ask for what you want and work hard for it and be curious about everything. Okay. That's awesome. Um, so that's where that curiosity comes from. Do you, just, do you have a, a place for people to go to see your work? Do you, uh, you have an Instagram? Or I have a an website? Instagram. It's uh, just my initials. It's WCW period IV, which stands for William Courtworthy Weaver the fourth. Okay, Super easy. I, yeah. um, Sweet. I'm, I'm excited because I, I've never even seen your Instagram or right. any of your work. So right. I'll be actually after this podcast, just right, <laughs> looking at it for the first time. Right. Right. And you know, I'm trying to update it more and stuff. Cause I have like, tons of tons of pictures and i'm like i need to just update my instagram so i'm doing that now you'll see stuff from gallup um may see stuff from my travels and uh you know if i go to ukraine in september you'll be able to see that through that too. Heck yeah that'll be awesome cool. sweet thanks for having me guys I of really course dude it. honestly yeah. this, is, this, is a, this is a good time <laughs> yeah thank you thanks for having me rock on all right bye everyone bye <laughs>